and welcome to another episode of Do Go On. My name is Dave Warnicky and as always I'm here with Matt Stewart and Jess Perkins. Hello Dave. Hey Dave. Hey Jess. Good to see you. And you Matt. Here in this place, your humble abode. My humble abode. In the affluent east. Oh, there's nothing humble about this. What's this, six, seven thousand square metres? Uh, I think it's uh, seven and a half actually. Wow, sorry. If you're including the grotto, <laughs> which oh, I do. Of course. <laughs> you got to include the grotto. Yeah. It's so good to be here. Um, I can't wait to get into it. Dave, how does this show work? Well, Matt, what we do here is we take it in terms of report on a topic often suggested to us by one of the listeners. Any listener can do that at any time at dogoonpod.com. And uh, we go away, do a bit of research, and then bring it back to the others who have no idea what the topic's going to be. And it is my turn to report. And we always start with a little pesky question. Ooh, a little pesky question. And let me ask you that question, guys. What supersonic airliner operated from 1976 to 2003? <sighs> the Concorde. Correct, sir. Yes. My report is on the rise and fall of Concorde. Concorde like is a it rings a very vague bell somewhere deep in the back of my brain, but I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, really? I feel it on my loins, Concorde. Okay. It um, was the future. It's interesting. And now it's the past. Yes. It was like, yeah, it's so <laughs> interesting. I'd love to know about this. Great. Well, I uh, have done this because it's been suggested by a few people. Thank you to Paul Meller from Oldham in the UK, Nick from Kent, and Ben Johnson from Milton Keynes. Ben Johnson. What a guy. What, what a, guy. a guy. And Paul, great Saints supporter. He's got on board the Saints, I believe, because this show is, as an Englishman, he's jumped on board. Oh, that's House nice. Hangers. <laughs> and I will just say of, of Ben Johnson He obviously likes fast things and fiery crashes That's what I have written here because uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Dave's got that bold on his computer And he's, he's sitting right next to me He suggested a few such topics Yes, yeah, so the Le Mans crash was ah, also suggested yes. of his And I don't want to give away too much But uh, this may end in a similar way All right. oh. Who was sorry? We've, uh, who was the middle person who suggested it? Uh, Nick from Kent. Hey, Nick. Good on you as well. We love you, Nick. <laughs> Keep it up, Nick. So they're all. It's an all English topic because this is a. This used to fly from, from, like London to America or something. Right? Yeah, well, it's an English and French topic, and this is actually my third French topic this year already. I've done Joan of Arc, the Le Mans crash, and now Concorde. God, you're obsessed with the French. I know, but I th- actually, speaking of Le Mans, I watched Ford versus Ferrari yesterday. Oh, good fun. Yeah, it was good. It's a good movie. It's a good movie, yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I haven't seen it, but... Um, it's good. Matt Damon. Oh, Matt Damon, yeah. Christian Bale. Oh, yeah, Christian Bale. Christian, Christian Bale is my favourite kind of role of his. Oh, I'm very good at something, but I'm not respected. <laughs> it's and, that. And the, and <laughs> Ford, uh, Henry Ford II, mm-hmm. or Deuce, as everyone called yeah, him. Yeah, not a he good nickname. P- played by um, the guy who's the coach in the new LA Lakers a uh, biopic sort of series oh, okay. about the 80s Lakers. Is that Could've good? Are you enjoying I've that? I've been enjoying it, yeah. John C. Riley, Love his work. Anyway, Dave, <laughs> what a weird sidetrack. Uh, I just want to say this one was voted for by our, our Patreon and supporters at dogoonpod.com. I put up three topics, the history of a certain thing or a product, and this one by a single vote. Whoa. Mm. So if you want to support the show on Patreon and you can inf- uh, legitimately influence what we talk about. you That happens to you a lot. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? It's because you're putting up such great options for them. Yeah, but not that great. Yeah, <laughs> They're all equally great. Oh, yeah. Not one standout great one like I do. Or equally bad. <laughs> or, yeah, equally or equally bad. bad. Well, they're, all kind of, they're all kind of going, options. I guess. Oh, yeah. I don't, know. I don't know what any of this is. Fine. Okay, See. so it could be any of these perspectives. Actually, I've been getting real close ones lately as well. It's great. I think it, yeah. I, I kind of like it when it's a landslide because I really feel confident we'll pick oh, the right one. Yeah. It's going to be a good topic. Yeah, yeah that's that's true. Uh, I actually thought of Concord as a topic when I was uh, uh, leaving Paris's Charles de Gaulle Airport a month or two ago on my honeymoon and I saw a Concorde on display as I was driving out in the, the taxi and I thought, surely that's just a replica. It's way too small. But when I looked into it, it was real. Wow. It was real. So they're quite quite a small plane and I, that got me thinking. So I looked up, is it in the hat? And it was. So thank you very much to everyone that supported it. Jess just noted that four and a half minutes before he mentioned his honeymoon. <laughs> I, thought, I didn't know what you were looking at. I saw you glance over. Uh, yep. Yeah, you're not wrong. Is that wrong. a new record? And it wasn't, on his, it wasn't on his screen, by the way. He added the honeymoon bit. 
Yeah, just wedges it in he the conversation that? wherever he can. Wh- when, well, since when I do, got when married. When have I ever mentioned it? When have <laughs> I ever mentioned as it? Often as anyway, me and my wife, <laughs> uh, we're on our honeymoon. My new wife. <laughs> <laughs> my first wife, as I refer to her. <laughs> okay, until Four and a half minutes. Okay, Dave, see if you can break that next week. Oh, I will. The history of honeymoons. <laughs> until the 1940s, it was a commonly held belief that exceeding the speed of sound, that is, breaking the sound barrier, would destroy an aircraft and any human being on board. Oh, wow. But that all changed with one man, Chuck Yeager. Yeager! Great name. And to be honest, it was also uh, changed by many other people who helped, but Chuck Yeager was the, the guy literally at the front of this breakthrough. He was a combat fighter during World War II who was a bit of a bad ass. Yes, we love a bad ass. Uh, the American pilot flew 64 missions over Europe and shot down 13 German planes. Jaeger himself was shot down over France, but he escaped capture with the assistance of the French underground. Oh, wow. That's Which pretty cool. cool. On October 12, 1944, he attained ace in a day status, shooting down five enemy aircraft in just one mission. Ace in a ace day. Ace in a day. I like that. Yeah, like a frog in a pond. Yeah. <laughs> Great dessert. <laughs> That's what I was oh, thinking. I love those. I hate frog in a pond. Really? It makes the Freddo go a weird texture. Yeah, I, I like the idea of it more than Yeah, I like the look is. of it. You're like, That's a bit of fun. As a kid, it was exciting. Well, at the but, pub. But oh, I, I, I love jelly. I love, yeah, so it's for international people, just in case it's not, I don't know how international it is. I think it's pretty international. It is a piece of chocolate shaped like a frog. Freddo frog. Inside jelly that's either green or blue. To represent the pond. Yeah, the frog is in the pond. This has got to be any, a thing we've ripped off from England. I Surely, yeah, it yeah. feels very English. Toad and then in the it's hole. a bit shit. <laughs> sucked in England. I love your food. That's no, why no, me, I like sucked it. Sucked in England and us for ripping off your <laughs> shit things. I, honestly, if I like the food, I just assume it's English because I like bad food. That is pretty clever, like for a pub dessert, though, on a kids' yeah. menu. Like, it's so easy. Very clever. And, like, it'd be pretty cheap to make. So that makes a lot of sense. But yeah, it makes the frog go a bit weird. Just give me a bowl of jelly and a Freddo. Let me have them separately without yeah. the without the frog going weird. Yeah. And let me eat the jelly. Yeah. Give Can me all the jelly. How much jelly do you have? Can give I it get to a me. Deconstructed frog in a pond. <laughs> do you mind? I'm I, such a Melbourne kid. <laughs> oh, I, lo- I love I love English uh, food as well to some extent. You know, big English breakfast. Mm-hmm. Uh, pints of <laughs> ale. Oh yeah. You know, I love I love. The list goes breakfast. on for you. Yeah. So he attained ace in a day status, eating five frog in a pond in one sitting. Whoa. Wow. They were impressed by that. But after the war, Jaeger stayed in the US Air Force and was among several volunteers chosen to test fly the experimental and ultra top secret X1 rocket plane. Rocket plane. Which was built by the Bell Aircraft Company to explore the possibility of supersonic flight. Is Bell the, Aircraft. <laughs> is the Bell Aircraft Company um, attached to the Bell Shakespeare Company? <laughs> yeah. Very, very similar. Are they? Both John Bell at the, uh, yes. at the head of both? Yes. Is, it a, is it from Bell Air or is it that's a pun or a portmanteau? It's, it's, du- or it's Bell yes. Aircraft Company. Uh-huh. And double L. Uh-huh. So No. <laughs> To answer your question, just a coincidence. I felt like the things I was saying was answering your question, but uh, you kept doing uh huh. <laughs> you know, I do that a bit now sometimes too. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they're employed to explore the possibility of supersonic flight. That is flight that breaks the sound barrier and travels faster than the speed of sound. So that's what supersonic. Why are you trying means. to beat sound? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's who cares if you're travelling faster than sound? Yeah, just travel. whoop de fucking do Travel the same speed as sound or slower than sound. Like, but why is sound the measure? Yeah. Like, I want to go faster than something fast. Yeah, not like, like a sound. cheetah. Yeah. Am I going... Am <laughs> I, I the cheetah barrier. Am I, am I flying <laughs> faster than the speed of cheetah? Yeah. Yes? Well, well that's, wonderful. That's exciting. Okay, great. Like, I don't understand why you're trying to beat sound. sound. What about, it's not even, even the, it's not the same category. It's different completely senses. completely different. One sense is speed. Yeah. One is sound. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> don't get them confused. Don't conflate the two. Jeez Louise. Jeez. I mean, but that's what science is always doing, trying to solve problems that no one needs to solve. Mm. Yeah. My sixth sense is speed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the movie? The movie speed, yes. <laughs> He can sense if somebody's watching it. My seventh sense, speed two, cruise control. <laughs> Do you think that someone in the world somewhere is watching the movie Speed at all times? Oh, I hope so. Yes. Around the world. Yeah. There's, uh, at any one time, someone in the world's watching, watching speed. speed. No doubt about that. Oh, great movie. 
That brings me joy. Uh, I found an aviation website. I think it's pronounced wikipedia.org. Oh, okay. okay, great. And what it's all about yeah. aircraft. Oh, it has loads of info on planes and pilots and has an article on Jaeger's first sound barrier breaking flight. Jaeger! <laughs> I love his name. He probably yelled that as he broke Jaeger! the speed of sound. Yeah, but nobody heard it. No, not for a I don't think that works anyway. scientifically, but I just wanted to have a crack <laughs> at a clever joke. <laughs> Was that clever? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is this thing on? <laughs> so when when he was uh, when he was in World War Two, would have been dropping a few Jaeger bombs. <laughs> <laughs> and going Jaeger. <laughs> Matt's sipping from his milk after that one. <laughs> <laughs> Drink your milk. <laughs> <laughs> Call that a victory sip in there, Biz. <laughs> Nail that joke. <laughs> I earned this sip of milk. <laughs> Okay, this is from Wikipedia.org. Two nights before the scheduled date for the flight, Jaeger broke two ribs when he fell from a horse. Why was he on a horse? I don't know. Right before a big day. Big don't go horse riding. He broke he broke his two ribs because he wanted to suck his own horse. <laughs> <laughs> then he realised, hang on, I don't even need these. I, don't, I can keep my ribs and suck this horse. <laughs> that wasn't the problem. Oh, that's good milk. He <laughs> did. You deserve that second victory <laughs> sip. You're right. I'm going to be a joke ace. Five jokes in this episode. <laughs> wow, that's never been done. <laughs> What's our record? One. What? <laughs> not good joke. We're not there, We're not there yet. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. You're not going for good. He was worried that the injury would remove him from the mission and reported that he went to a civilian doctor in nearby Rosamond who taped his ribs. Besides his wife who was riding with him on the horse, Jaeger told only his friend and fellow project pilot Jack Ridley about the accident. So he didn't tell anyone because he's worried he'll get struck from the mission. On the day of the flight, Jaeger was in such pain that he could not seal the X-1's hatch by himself. Ridley, the only guy I told, rigged up a device using the end of a broom handle as an extra lever to allow Jaeger to seal the hatch. So he battled through the pain which is not a good idea. And on October 14, 1947, Jaeger flew the X-1 over Rogers Dry Lake in Southern California, exceeding 662 miles per hour, which is the sound barrier at 40,000 feet. So he did it. And it, and people are going, well, he's going to explode. <laughs> yes. And he did it with two broken ribs. But it turns out that oh. uh, if you break your ribs, yeah. there's less pressure inside your body. So that's the only reason he didn't explode. Oh, okay. Oh, that's ex- so it's actually really convenient. It's great. So from now on, if, you ha- if you're on the Concorde, someone stood there with a baseball bat, gave you one on each side, and then you got to go on. Bloody hell, that's very impressive. So the speed of sound varies under a few factors, including altitude, but an object that travels at the speed of sound is referred to as traveling at Mach 1. Uh, when you hear Mach speed, uh, that yes. means it's traveling at the speed of sound. So when the presidents of the United States of America, the band, sang, I will survive in my Mach 5, in my Mach 5, I will survive, what, is, what does that mean? So yeah, d- what does that mean? Because it always felt like gibberish, but was it? <laughs> <laughs> or was it just words I didn't yet know? <laughs> well, well, double the speed is Mach 2, Mach 3 is three times and so on. And that's also a th- <laughs> Gillette's. Revolutionary three-blade razor. Yeah, that travels at <laughs> the speed three. of sound. They, that was a big ad campaign. <laughs> We've done it. <laughs> We've somehow figured out how to put a third razor blade on this razor. They said it couldn't they, be done. They said it couldn't be done. They <laughs> thought that the razor blade would explode. Yeah, they thought that <laughs> humans shaving with three blades would disintegrate. <laughs> <laughs> it's too powerful. Uh, Chuck later himself described breaking the sound barrier for the first time. He said, I noticed that the faster I got, the smoother the ride. Mm, much like on a jet ski. <laughs> Is that true? Yeah. Oh, cool. So then you're just sort of skimming across the top. <laughs> Love that. Suddenly, the mark needle began to fluctuate. It went up to 0.965 mark. Then it tipped off the scale. We were flying supersonic. And it was as smooth as a baby's bottom. Why do people say that? Stop obsessing over baby's butts. Grandma could be sitting up there sipping lemonade. What does that mean? <laughs> off the butt. <laughs> off the it's, butt. Because it's so butt. yeah, you could be grandma could be sitting on that baby's <laughs> ass sipping lemonade. <laughs> yeah, why are baby's asses the? Why, are they even s- smooth? I feel like they'd be real soft. Yeah. <laughs> is that the same, same as smooth? Same thing, I guess. And is it, is, is it like Mark 1, Mark 2, the smoother the baby's bottom, 
baby bottom two. Yeah, it's twice that's as true. Right. Baby's like bottom. that, you'd think because they'd be they, they don't squat or anything. They'd have hardly any glute muscles. Yeah, they're actually pathetic at squats. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, watch a baby do a squat. You'll feel so good about yourself. That's what it that should be. A fucking idiot trying to squat. Pathetic as a baby's bottom. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it should be. <laughs> you're you're currently being as pathetic as a baby's bottom, in that it has no muscle structure. <laughs> yeah, I think that's better. I think right. we'll fix that one. Do yeah. you want to take a victory sip of that one or no? I don't know. Is that was that worthy of a no, sip? I'm just, I'm just saying you could if you want. I mean, my problem the way I'm going at the moment is this milk is going to be all gone. You're <laughs> sipping too hard. Because of the top secrecy of the project, Jaeger's achievement wasn't announced to the world for eight months. So we had to sit on, sit on, on a that baby's record. Butt. We had to sit on the baby's butt. That's right. Sip of lemonade. But when it was, the world knew that it was possible for humans and aircraft to travel faster than the speed of sound. Again, who cares? It can be done. But why? But that would play havoc with your, you know, your stereo system. In if, the yeah, plane. if you're going faster than the speed of sound... If you, like, once he hits supersonic and he's like, I'm going faster than the speed of sound, if he went, woohoo, does he hear that? No, that's, I think that goes behind <laughs> that's him. That's back there. That's back there where he, he said it. sucked back. Right? Yeah. Like, so The songs go backwards? If he's playing, you know. Yeah, he's, if he's going faster than the speed of sound, what are the songs doing? Yeah, so he's playing he, Highway to the Danger Zone. Is that <laughs> running backwards? He was the first one to hear all those messages in the Beatles songs. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Hang on a second, there's Whoa, something here. I should join the Navy. <laughs> Well, it was a big deal because instantly airlines and governments around the world began to speculate about the possibility of creating a commercial plane that travelled faster than the speed of sound. Obviously, that would make journeys much quicker and who doesn't want to go on holiday or on business faster? Mm, Makes sense. The race was on to design a plane and both the Soviets and the USA had plans to build supersonic transport, a.k.a. an SST. That's what they're called. Boeing won the competition for a government-funded contract to build an American supersonic airliner called the Boeing 2707. They began developing it at its facilities in Seattle, Washington. (gasps) A short time later, in 1966, Seattle was awarded a franchise in the NBA. I was was going to say this before. That makes sense. Because of the contract, they called the Seattle Supersonics. So there's another 1966 sports fact. Wow, that's so funny. As soon as you said Supersonics, I'm like... I wonder if that's got anything to do with the basketball team. Yeah, because people, thousands of people got jobs in their city doing this. It became this right. big project for the cool. city. And they were like, oh, let's call it the Seattle Supersonics. Rest in peace. Well, the team actually lasted longer than the Boeing contract, which was cancelled due to rising costs in 1971. Mm. So the USA pulled out of the race. They went, it's too expensive to make this SST. The Seattle Supersonics stopped existing in 2008 when they moved cities and changed their name to Oklahoma City Thunder. I don't mind Thunder as a team name. That's all right. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's good. But how do you how do you draw it? A cloud. Yeah, yeah like a lightning bolt. I know. So that's lightning. Yeah, but lightning yeah. lightning is just the sound of thunder, right? No. Oh. Lightning is the sound of thunder. Thunder's the sound of lightning. Yes. Sorry. Okay. No. <laughs> Still no. <laughs> Still a no. Try a third one. <laughs> but yeah, they, they often go hand in hand, but not always. Really? Well, mm. there you go. I always thought it was the set, the lightning, because that's why you can tell how far. Or is that a myth as well? The account in between seeing the lightning, speed of sight is faster than the speed of sound. Speed so of light. S- yeah, what I, did mean, I say? I could be wrong. The speed of sight. Oh, speed of light is. I thought I said light. Anyway, so speed of light is faster than the speed of sound. Yeah, the closer it is, the quicker the gap yep, is between the lightning true. and thunder. What is thunder? <laughs> You learn things on this podcast. Thunder is a sound caused by lightning. Which you were absolutely right. Give that man a medal. And I said, Matt, you fucking idiot. <laughs> you did say that. How dare you? With my eyes. Yes. How dare you waste my time with your stupid opinions. Um, but no, you're absolutely right. So um, there you go. Sort of like the Melbourne Storm, the local rugby league team, is their symbols are lightning yeah. bolt. So if, if they can use that, surely the thunder can. Storm feels like more of a general term, doesn't it? Mm. Anyway. <laughs> I like weather-based team names, though. Are you looking um, at what? Th- like like the thunder? Gold Coast Suns. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, see, they, it, they don't really... They just have a basketball as their logo. I read this article about American sports logos a while ago, and they were saying that 
a lot of the uh, NBA teams have basketballs in their logos because it where it came from as a sport. It was the uh, what uh, it wasn't that popular a few decades ago. So they were like they had to really show the sport right. in their logos. Whereas the uh, the biggest sports, you know, the football teams didn't have to put footballs in all yeah. their logos. All right, but people go Oklahoma City. What yeah, do you, Thunder. What do you do? Like yeah, golf? that's right. Are you branding. golfing? <laughs> yeah, Is this really a good. golf team? Yeah, water yeah. polo. I don't care. <laughs> But that is the team of young Josh Giddy, the young Aussie that got drafted. Uh, but there you go. A 1966 sports fact. Maybe that can be the new one. Yeah. Yeah. Or just just add it to the Arsenal. I think Chicago Bulls also formed that year. <sighs> a big year in sport. Big year. So USA dropped out, but the Soviets began designing their SST called the TU-144, which sounds like a Terminator. I fucking love it. Yeah. In 1962. At the time, it was thought that all future air travel would be supersonic, so no one wanted to miss out. But then you that, wouldn't yeah. have your like seventeen-hour flights, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know. Yeah, we wouldn't have we, you know, people wouldn't be able to complain about coming to Australia. Yeah, it's so far. They still would. <laughs> yeah, they still. Oh, now I don't have an excuse. <laughs> But then I, I get, it, but it would be all like relative. So their flights around their home countries would. Half. So oh, they go, true, the yeah. flight to Australia, geez, six and a half hours. Yeah. That's three times as long as it takes for me to, to do this flight. Yeah. So it's still, it's still, still complain. complain. At, but you, at, the logic holds up, right? That you'd assume, oh, there's this big advancement. For sure. Every, like, they'll, the more we make this happen, the yeah. cheaper it will become and it'll just be, you know, become more cost effective. Yeah. Whatever. And I mean, it definitely makes sense to make flight as quick as possible and to keep trying to make that faster for the convenience of many different things, not just travel, but also, you know, getting things from A to B and whatever. Yeah. But why are you trying to beat sound? Yeah. Why is that your focus? Just say, can we fly real fucking fast? <laughs> but that was the first hurdle. Look, there's some planes over there. Wow. They're oh, flying in formation. They're flying over the Formula One, they which are. is on during in Melbourne during the time of recording. That's fun, though. But we're talking about planes, and there's some planes. There, there you what go. What are the odds of that? They're the roulette. <laughs> I think that's the roulette. Ah. To put on a bit of a show. So, you say sound is the thing, because that was the first thing that they didn't think that you could go faster than that. If you reach that speed, they thought all planes and humans would die. So you got to get through that before you can go really fucking fast. I still fast. think it's stupid. Like I just don't like just aim for really fast. Why specifically under the lens of sound? Yeah, ironically, the <laughs> logic—the first barrier is not but sound. It, why are we putting these barriers on ourselves? <laughs> yeah. What I'm saying. <laughs> so I feel like my stupidity is frustrating, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> well, what you need to know, Jess, is they really thought all planes would soon be the only way to travel in this supersonic way. And everyone wanted to be first, and which the Soviets were in a way, but I'll talk about that and how it turned out in a minute. Okay. So the race was on, and many of their rivals were surprised when on November 29, 1962, Britain and France signed a treaty to share costs and risks in producing their own SST. Oh. This is where the craft gets its name from. Concorde is a French word, but it's also an English word. Word. Okay. Concorde with an E on the end is how the French spell it. Mm-hmm. English spell it without the E on the end. Both mean agreement, harmony, or union. Oh, that's so nice. So two countries coming together. So a shared word. Great. Let's use that. Do they use the French or the English version? Well, English aviation minister Tony Benn recalled to The Guardian how the spelling of Concorde came about. The original plan was that both the French and English Concords would be spelled with an E. Okay. But the then British Prime Minister Macmillan, Harold Macmillan, had been insulted by French President Charles de Gaulle on one visit when de Gaulle said he had a cold and couldn't see him. So Macmillan came back and removed the E from the end. That's respect. <laughs> yeah, I'm He's so sorry, tr- I'm Prime Minister. I don't want to pass on my this on. Sickness. I'm unwell. He probably had COVID. You know yeah, what I mean? I know. Imagine he was looking after Imagine you. in this day and age being insulted by that. Yeah. If somebody cancelled plans because they were sick and didn't Cough want to get me in sick. In my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> How, How dare, dare you. you? But also, but it's the pettiest thing you can do. Come home, remove the E, cut the E. We're not, we're not, we're not using that fuck French that shit. Yeah, fuck that, fuck that guy. Yeah, fuck that guy. That's embarrassing <laughs> with a big E. But then the uh, Tony Benn, the aviation minister, he reversed that. He said, we had to have the same name for the same aircraft. And besides, it was reversing an insult for the French which I wasn't in favour of. He didn't think it was an insult. No, it's it's not. 
McMillan, let it go, man. <laughs> Who cares? But he didn't come see me and I made cucumber sandwiches. <laughs> uh, it took me ages. I didn't know how to make a sandwich. M- McMillan never used a knee again. <laughs> stop, stop doing ecstasy as well. <laughs> so it's spelt with an E on the end. Uh, Flight of the Concords, spelt C-H-O-R-D-S, is a pun. Concords. Because chords. Yeah. That's fun. There we go. It's, a, it's funny the first time you hear it. And then it gets less funny each time after that. The b sharps. <laughs> British Aerospace and the French firm Aerospatiale, which was a predecessor of Airbus and the British Aircraft Corporation, which still ex- exists, agreed to produce the supersonic airliner. Hmm. Aerospatiale was responsible for the airframe, while Britain's Rolls-Royce and France's Snecma <laughs> Which is an acronym that I don't know what it stands for. Snekma. That is an ugly word. Yeah, oh, don't like that. As opposed to special, which is a yeah. real punch up of special, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Yeah, special. Oh, special. Oh my god. I don't feel worthy to be near this word. So Rolls Royce and Snekma developed the jet engines. The agreement stated that the aircraft would be built in both the UK and France so they could both claim it. Okay, yeah, sure. So do a bit each. That's nice. Uh, in the early 1960s, aeronautical engineers didn't have today's design and analysis tools or advanced computers. So they're what? basically... They should, have, they should have had them. I know. That would have made it real Why didn't they have them? Easier. They chose to do it all by hand. What oh. do you mean? That seems like it would take so much more time. It does, but it feels like more of an achievement. It feels, you know... Nah, I They disagree. definitely should have used modern technology. I love today. leaning on technology. Yeah. Mm. Even basic maths. Just chuck that on my phone. Just to check. Oh, yeah. All good. Yeah, just in your notes. Five plus five, that is ten. Yeah, they worked <laughs> it out. Just write it in my notes. They worked it out on the notes app. Wow. <laughs> uh, they basically had to do it all by hand, as I said, but Concorde's designers came up with a remarkably advanced and unique aircraft. Honestly, uh, Concorde is an absolute design marvel. And I'm not even a big plane guy, but when I was writing this, I really started to nerd out over it. So okay. here's a bit of that nerd bit. Well, let us beat that out of you because <laughs> we're jocks. Yeah. Aren't we, Matt? Yeah. Yeah, we like sport and beer. <laughs> Matt did just stop the podcast to point at a plane again. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> That's been me every time. Well, you time. both did it. Every time it's gone past, I've, I've, I've stopped listening to you. <laughs> I've missed chunks of this because I've been going, plane. I can see a crane as well, but Please. I'm keeping it together. <laughs> yeah, there is a crane. I, really I can see many cranes. Oh, my God. I think, you know, they, it's cool. It's wild that they can do it, but I, it's like... A, a lot of things. It's like fireworks and stuff. People going, whoa, look at these planes zooming around. I'm like, I'd be impressed if it was like, you know, you two flying those planes. I'm like, wow, look, that's cool. But these are like trained f- pilots. But how do you know that? <laughs> I thought you meant if, if it was you two flying the planes. <laughs> if Bono was in charge. I thought he meant if we were just <laughs> flying, not even in planes. That would be impressive. Yeah, I mean, if, yeah, that would be even more impressive, I'd say. Well, let me try and impress you with the nerdy part of the report. Let's start with the speed. For context, a usual Boeing 747 that you've probably been on cruises at about 560 miles per hour. Okay. That's 901 kilometers per hour, which is Mark 0.84. Yeah, I think that's broken the the speed of cheetah sound. (laughs) Yeah. Cheetahs notoriously. Faster than a cheetah going, (laughs) wow. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. So they're going at 900 k's an hour. 900 k's an hour at an altitude of 35,000 feet. Just over 10,500 meters. I mean, I should have, I could have logically figured that out. I didn't know how fast a plane went, but it takes you an hour to fly to Sydney from yeah. Melbourne. That's around 900 k's. Yeah, there you go. So I guess that makes sense. Yeah, I guess that well checks done. out. But what? this, but, so that's a normal plane. That's a normal plane. Ones that you go on that we still use. 767, on, something like that. 747. Yeah, but they're all pretty similar to that. On the other hand, ballpark figure. On the other hand, a Concorde could cruise at 1,350 miles per hour, which is 2,172 k's an hour. That's more than double. Which is Mark II, twice the speed of sound. Wow. And they flew at... So remember 747, 35,000 feet? Concorde, 60,000 feet. Wow. You're 18,300 metres. You're 18 kilometres in the air. Oof. And at that height, passengers were actually able to see the curvature (gasps) of the Earth. Wow. Oh, that's cool. So cop that flat earthers. You just that's need to go cool. back to the 80s and get on one of these. That's so fast. It's so fast. You'd be in Sydney in 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. You I'm know, it would, they'd be throwing cookies from the front of the place. There's no time to do oh. ser- snack service. Just, it feels like once it's that fast and you're spending more time at the airport, it would feel weird. Oh, it would feel silly, wouldn't it? You'd be like, I'll just drive to Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> By the time I go, I get there an hour early so I can check my bags and then I, they get us on the plane. And then it's 20 minutes. We're up, we're down. Oh, they're going to wait for my bags at the other side. If the pilot looks out the window at the wrong time. You're in, in Brisbane. By yeah. Accident. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, shit. Just trying to turn around without anyone noticing. <laughs> well, actually, those planes are flying real close together now. That's cool. You're impressed? Yeah, I can't, that looks dangerous. I can't see them now. Where are they? They're just going by that tree. Come back. I hope they don't fly too close I to that tree. I hope they're playing scorpions, uh, rock me, rock you like a hurricane. <laughs> Here I am. Was but, it that one? But yeah. backwards. <laughs> yeah. They'll, the Surely. pilots will be hearing it backwards, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they prefer it that way now. That's how they hear all music. I saw um, them play that in when I was in Germany. So whoa. It was, and it was, it was pretty great. And I remember the singer, he just said a lot. He said, come on, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so that all the whole way through their set, he just said it a lot. <laughs> come on, baby. <laughs> do, do you know what are any of their other songs? Uh, their, you... bi- their biggest song, which apparently is uh, Winds of Change. Oh, okay. Do they refu- used to play that live? Uh, yeah, they refuse to play it live. Apparently, it's <laughs> apparently uh, j- j- it's really on the nose over there because it was flogged when the w- wall came down. It was oh. became almost the unofficial anthem of that. And then people maybe them and David it. Hasselhoff. And I think people are just sick of it. Yeah. So I get why you were nerding out. That is really fast. It's amazing. Isn't and it? seeing the curvature of the earth and going so high, like. And apparently, the sky is so blue up there. Wow. It's a beautiful view. Apparently. That's cool. Also, I guess you'd have to go higher because there'd be so much traffic. And you know when you're stuck behind a slow driver? <laughs> yes, that's and right. And all these planes would be so slow comparatively. Oh, and you'd be and like, go, you'd have to go like around them. Stay in the left lane unless yeah. overtaking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they don't. They don't. They just sit in the right lane and just plot along. The pilot is constantly like, on the horn. I am going more than double what you're going. Like, They're like, on. Oh, I'm going the limit. And you're like, well, you think you're going the limit, but you, I think you're... Your speedo's a bit off because yeah. you're actually going 5Ks under. Yeah. Can you just get across? Yeah, move over. So that makes sense. I think yeah. that's probably why they go higher. They should have just made a third lane, a Concord lane. Concord lane, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they did it, 60,000 feet. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's a, yeah. They and then they could, also, they could also prank and like dump the toilet on the other oh, planes. That's, so fun. that's fun. You'd have to get the timing just right yeah. because they're going so slow and you're going so fucking fast. You know what I mean? Yeah, but if you nail it, it's very funny. Very good, very satisfying. So, to travel at supersonic speeds, the Concorde had to be designed completely differently from other existing passenger planes, which would fall apart and disintegrate at these supersonic speeds. Wow. Planes like the 747 feature low wings, which means the wings are mounted lower than halfway up the fuselage, the long, thin David, part David, if plane. you'd asked me what are low wings, I would have, I reckon, figured that one out. Yeah, that one probably didn't need... That the explain, wings would be... Explaining. ...lower... <laughs> Well, they st- basically, they stick out on either side, and they're most planes you've seen. Concorde, on the other hand, had double delta wings, Ooh. which are shaped like triangles. DDs. And look... Oh, they're massive Double Ds. DDs. <laughs> uh, they're shaped like triangles and look super cool, in my opinion. They sort of go out. It's like a corn chip on either side of the plane. Yeah, cool. That is super cool. <laughs> corn chip on either side. That is really cool. The problem they had to overcome was most delta-shaped wings that cruise at super high speeds aren't well suited for taking off. So they're really good once you're up in the air, but they're very difficult ah, to get off the ground. Okay. So they needed wings that were able to take off, but once in the air, able to cruise at these supersonic speeds. According to PBS, it took over 5,000 hours of wind tunnel testing before Concorde's designers and engineers were confident that they had the optimal shape. Right. But if you, if you Google a Concorde, they look real cool. Ended up being Pringle-shaped. Um, which yeah. I think is interesting. It's sort of and you cannot fit your hand in it. No. <laughs> but once you pop, you cannot stop That's right. flying. Concorde also featured a long and thin adjustable needle-shaped nose. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Something that a guy from the Smithsonian, who I watched a video on, referred to as a droop snoot. It's a, si- it's a sick plane. It, it looks, looks cool. like a good fly into the space. I've just Google imaged it and I... I, I, I'm now I've definitely seen that Yeah like a, spa- sure. a yeah. space shuttle Also f- yeah. f- features delta wings Delta car and truck rental Just call 131319 Delta Is something I think Whenever I hear the word delta <laughs> <laughs> I think innocent eyes <laughs> Innocent eyes What is that? Oh delta good Delta good <laughs> I also think uh, My second favourite 
Australian gladiator from the show Gladiators. Mm. Oh, right. I was a big fan of Tower. Oh. <laughs> the tall man. So what Tower's great, but everyone's favourite, of course, is Vulcan. Vulcan. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Gotta be Vulcan. <laughs> He's the superstar of the show. Oh, absolutely. Then they had uh, Australians versus English gladiators, and they had someone called Dynamite, and he was pretty cool oh, too. Oh, that's good. That's Dynamite's a good. good that's a good gladiator name. Yeah. What would your gladiator name be? <laughs> the scientist. <laughs> <laughs> Yours would. You'd have a beaker. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be called the beaker. <laughs> that's good. I'm constantly trying to like do a science experiment whilst they're like trying to pile drive me <laughs> I think, off, I off think a swing. I'd Much. Much Dave's version of that would be being on the chase. One of the one of yeah. the chase. the beaker. The beaker. <laughs> the beaker. I think I'd be the tank. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tank's good. <laughs> I'd love to be called something like the nugget, but I was I'm not say at all. Nugget for <laughs> you. <laughs> I'm just like I'm the opposite of a nugget. Well, maybe that's like one of those ironic ones. Yeah, which that's I true. think tank is for me. Lank, lank. You're lank in the tank. We could be a duo. Oh, yes, yes. There we love go. It. He's lanky, I'm tanky. (laughs) 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 Is that something? I don't know. We can workshop it. Yeah. As always, uh, Dave, feel free to edit any of this out. (laughs) Do us a solid. Whoever does the report, listeners, they do the edit. So anything that's left in, in this case, do not blame me and Jess. Yeah, it's our fault. Any reference to gladiators, I'm not cutting. (laughs) Vulcan, if you're listening, we love you. We, we love, love you, you. Vulcan. <laughs> we love, you, love Vulcan. you, Vulcan. You too, Delta. So it's the it's got a needle like nose, which you may yeah. have seen the image there. Which some dude I watch refer to as a droop snoot, which I loved. Love that droop snoot because during takeoff and landing, Concorde flew at such a steep angle as it was going up, with its front end tilted skyward and its tail pointing down. <laughs> Probably didn't say that bit. A normal <laughs> nose would completely block the pilot's view and they couldn't uh, see anything. Ah, okay. But Concorde's long pointed nose had a hinge as the plane took off landed and taxied the pilots tilted its nose forward so it sort of lowers down a bit but when you're in the air and they want to go supersonic a hydraulic lift puts the snaps the nose into place Ah, which is real cool that's really cool i think like if the plane was taking off and you're like going straight up that would be awful as a passenger i would hate that that feels like it'd be fun i've done it in a seaplane and it was awful (laughs) When did you go on a seaplane? That's cool. Many, many years ago. I was on a um, a jet ski tour and you stopped at this little island. Jeez, you're banging on about jet skis. I though. love jet skis. <laughs> I love them. Um, and we stopped at a little island for a rest and a seaplane pilot wanders over and the tour that he had flown there was, you know, doing an activity and he's like, you guys want to come for a joyride? What the hell? What? This sounds you like... You sound like you're... Are you some sort of VIP... Eccentric millionaire? <laughs> I was. Were you staying on Richard Branson's island or yeah. something? It sounds like you're about to be kidnapped. It was awful. It wasn't. It was cool. Was the pilot Baloo? Yes. Okay. From the show. <laughs> what was There was a show he was on and he flew a... For some reason, the Baloo, the bear from Jungle Book, had a spin-off show where he was a pilot in a <laughs> seaplane. <laughs> it's such a weird spin-off. You've it's going to be one of the up. weirdest spin-offs. You've made that I think up, you dreamt that. Sure. You've dreamt that, I'm sure of it. Baloo the pilot. Do you, you know Baloo from... Yeah, well, yeah, that's what I thought when the you jungle? said Baloo, but I was like, this has got to be something else. But it's it's Baloo from the Jungle Book. Yeah. And Flying he, a seaplane. He puts a shirt on and he flies okay. a seaplane and there's a little kid bear who like oh. uh, has a little sort of board that he surfs behind the plane sometimes. Okay, well, that's quite cute. What was that show called? Have I made it up? I reckon you've dreamt that. What a what a great dream. So they call it, it oh, incredible. Uh, the Air Necessities. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes, Dave. If only you had a milk. <laughs> I'd be sipping. I'd be sipping right now. Do you want me now. to get you a milk to sip? <laughs> um, yeah, that would just be really... I just think that would be a bit full on. Yeah, so th- this... And then once the nose snaps into place... It's so pointed and needle shaped, it efficiently pierces the air. So yeah. that's another reason it went so quick. Wow. But to get into the sky and cruise at such wild speeds, they needed incredible engines. The planes featured four turbojet engines in total that were twice as powerful as engines on large subsonic jets. That makes sense. If you, if, I mean, if you're going to go twice the speed, it makes yeah. sense to have the engines twice the size. Twice as much NOS. Yeah, yeah. Do they have more NOS? Well, kind of mounted in pairs <laughs> under the wings. 
Oh each my god, he's found it. It's called Tailspin. Oh, they fucked that. <laughs> yeah, they really fucked that. Air necessities would have been so much better. Oh, and is that King Louis was yeah. in it as well? How weird is that? What a strange... That feels like someone's just gone into the pitch meeting with Pie. nothing. They've gone in stone. <laughs> they're, they're, they're looking at things around the room, you know? Uh, uh, there's yeah. a Jungle Book poster on the wall from yeah. their previous hits. Oh, yeah, it's Baloo. But he's a pilot. <laughs> and they're like, okay, he goes, but not just any pilot. He's a seaplane pilot. pilot. Sounds and, like and and King Louis. I think King Louis like ran a bar. <laughs> oh, I my God. And there's a little bear because we love to have cute things, and it surfs. It's that's like a level one improv class. You have to stop room. smoking weed before these meetings. You're killing us. That's a brilliant idea. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. That was a movie or a show? TV show. Yeah. How long did it run for? I, I reckon it used to be on in the afternoon, like it's just like an after school. This show. is a worthy detour, Dave. Oh, I'm I'm fascinated by it. I'm uh, surprised I didn't see it on Cheese TV. Seven point six out of ten on IMDb. Okay. Or actually, it'd be more appropriate on Saturday Disney. Only yeah. one season. Yeah, that, there we go. Sixty-five episodes <laughs> though. <laughs> That's a long season. Sixty-five episodes. Wow. Imagine if Gossip Girl did sixty-five episodes a season. Jesus Christ. Oh, Baloo, King Louie, and Sheer Khan. Who was the? Wasn't That's he the baddie? They operate a business in Cape <laughs> Suzette. That's that's the uh, they elevator oper- pitch from Google. <laughs> they operate a business. <laughs> Couldn't be any vaguer. <laughs> yeah, that is. Okay. I love it. I love it so much. Well, a good it's memory from the you year had there. 1990. Well, okay. Well, so to answer your question, Matt, the seaplane pilot was not Baloo. <laughs> <laughs> now back to Dave's report. Matt, I'm trying to talk about engines. <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry, listeners. <laughs> Jeez, that'd be that's tedious stuff. So you've missed the fact that they've got four massive turbojet engines, twice as powerful as a normal plane, mm. mounted in pairs under the wings. Each engine could provide more than thirty-eight thousand pounds of thrust, which sounds great. <laughs> I can personally do forty thousand. <laughs> that's too much thrust. That's too much you thrust, will Dave. disintegrate yeah. your co-pilot order. <laughs> My co-pilot. So to speak. That's what I refer to. <laughs> <laughs> Mind if I uh, jump up in the cockpit? That sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. God, you're a perf. (laughs) (laughs) I just want to watch. (laughs) Get me in the cockpit. (laughs) Concorde was the first and still only regularly used passenger aircraft that had turbojet engines with afterburners. Which is called reheat by the British. Raw fuel was introduced into the engines of the plane's four engines, immediately increasing the engine's thrust by almost 20%. Into the engines of the plane's four engines. Has your co-pilot ever said, <laughs> can you up the thrust by 20%? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know that? that plane spotters? And that's, what, that's how they get about in the boudoir. <laughs> up the thrust by 20%. <laughs> don't, don't whisper it. <laughs> Oh, oh, scream it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> He's getting a bit passionate. Reheat was also used to push the plane from subsonic to supersonic speeds. This is similar to technology used by fighter jets and space yeah, shuttles. Yeah, it's like it has a space shuttle kind of yeah. feel about it. The side effects of this were a red fiery glow in the engines, which is cool, but they were also incredibly loud, ah, not so cool. You couldn't even be watching Devil Wears Prada that comfortably on yeah. that plane. Oh, subtitles are on. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, they're going faster than the speed of sound, though. They would hear it, right? Oh, yeah. You wouldn't hear that sound. Because they're going faster. It's all though. good. You can't possibly hear anything. Yeah, but... You'd be going, ah, ah, <laughs> everyone's screaming. Can't hear a thing. It's the most peaceful flight you'll ever have. The plane behind is... I hope I sit next to some babies. <laughs> <laughs> they're so cute. <laughs> and quiet. <laughs> and soft. <laughs> Especially their bums. That's pathetic. Hello, little baby. Can I touch your bum? <laughs> See, it's weird. Why would you do that? You wouldn't do that. No. God. That's a great out of context quote. Anyway, <laughs> um, like I said at the start, they weren't very big. Concorde measured 204 feet or 62 meters in length, which is about the same length as a Boeing 747. Okay. But the fuselage where the passengers sit was three times as narrow. Oof. So they're very thin. But they still went. Two, three, two. <laughs> yeah. That's what's crazy about it. They're only ten they're only ten feet wide. I can't so, I can't conceptualize so that. Three meters, the height of a basketball ring on its side, and then <laughs> and then you can walk around in that bit. Can you imagine that? That's pretty small. It is small. So is it just like maybe two seats in an aisle or something? Yeah, it's two aisle two. Oh, okay, yep. 
they can't just scale it up so that it's like twenty percent bigger all yeah. over. During does that still heat. work? Yeah. <laughs> just, just bump it up. Twenty percent more thrust. Twenty percent more <laughs> <laughs> more passengers. So it was 204 feet long, but it would actually stretch between 6 and 10 inches in flight during to, due to heating of the, of the frame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 6 to 10 inches. Yeah. Received. Nice. Uh, message received, let clear. <laughs> <laughs> know what you're talking about there. <laughs> what? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, it was so hot from the friction of flying through the air at such high speeds when it flew that they had to come up with a new type of reflective white paint to paint it with. Oh, wow. The friction was so great that even the windows were hot to touch for passengers during the flight. So if you touched the window, it was really hot. It doesn't seem like the most pleasant way to travel, to be honest. No, it's very loud, very quite hot on the, the wind. it's fast. Exactly. Just to talk about the, the, the paint. France briefly painted one of their planes in a predominantly blue colour scheme, with the exception of the wings after a deal with Pepsi. Yeah, so <laughs> it could really blend into the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So it's Pepsi blue, but in this paint scheme, Air France was advised to remain at Mark II, the top speed, for no more than 20 minutes at a time, otherwise it would get too hot. Wow. That's how much a difference the white paint oh. would make versus any other colour. How interesting. Jeez, Pepsi would want to be paying a lot for that. <laughs> yeah. Pepsi's colours are also the French flag colours. They're, they're patriots. Yeah. Huh. How about that? Makes you think, hey? Yeah, it really does. It really does. What does Pepsi mean in French? Hmm. Hmm, Pepsi. <laughs> I think I nailed that. <laughs> I think you did too. <laughs> uh, each Concorde had room for about 100 passengers. But I'll talk about what it was like to fly on Concorde in a little bit. Okay. So far, I'm, I'm actually sticking to the... Uh, 747 or whatever. Regular? Yeah. Airbus. Give me one of those. Because sure, like this might be going twice the speed, right? So let's say it halves your travel time. So yep. it's only going to take me nine hours to get to, it's probably more still, like 10 hours to get to London, you know? But 10 hours on this sounds fucking ex- terrible. You know what I mean? What well, the view's beautiful. Yeah, the view's nice. It's incredibly loud. It's very hot. No, inside, they, I must say, they, they air condition it as but usual. But you know I touch the windows. <laughs> yes, with your tongue. I love to lick the windows. I burnt my tongue. That's why you guys always give me the window seat. Yeah. Otherwise, you start licking us. Yeah. i got to lick something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at takeoff, Concorde carried roughly 31,000 gallons or nearly 120,000 litres of fuel, which weighed more than 200,000 pounds. The fuel, because it needs more fuel than a regular plane because yeah. it burns so much. Yeah. The fuel was distributed across 13 tanks. Throughout the flight, fuel was ingeniously transferred from tank to tank throughout to oh. maintain the balance of the plane's centre of gravity. Oh, Obviously, clever. not very uh, superstitious, having 13 mm, fuel tanks. No. They didn't have a row 13, though. So, <laughs> so Even that. But, but they did have a bay 13 where people got absolutely <laughs> wasted. Bit of an MCG joke there. Uh, before takeoff and during acceleration to supersonic speeds, about 20 tons of fuel was moved backwards to tanks in the plane's tail and wings. As the aircraft slowed down at the end of the flight, fuel was pumped forward to the tank near the plane center. So it's constantly automatically shifting fuel around, which wow. is which Very clever. Was, yeah, amazing technology. Now, uh, speaking of takeoff, former British Airways Concorde captain John Ty explains what it was like to take off on a Concorde. Okay. He said. Each takeoff was a phenomenal experience. What's this guy's job title again? He was a, a captain. Okay. Seems a little biased, but okay. <laughs> each takeoff was, well, in, in, in comparison to other planes he flew, yeah. each takeoff was a phenomenal experience. The performance such that we had to warn the passengers in advance what to expect. Yeah, fair enough. The roar of the Rolls-Royce Olympus engines combined with being pushed back into your seat was like no other civilian plane. Far out. Because there's... You really feel the G's. <laughs> it feels uh, I'm I'm anxious. I don't think I don't think I'd want to do it. I'd be, I'll drive. <laughs> it's all right. I'll drive. <laughs> I'll drive. I'll drive to London. I'll drive. Drive to London. It's okay. I'll figure it out. There's got to be bridges. 
uh, with a takeoff speed of 220 knots or 250 miles per hour and a cruising speed of 1,350 miles, like I said, which is more than twice the speed of sound, a typical London to New York crossing would take less than three and a half hours as opposed to about eight hours for a subsonic flight taken by other planes. Wow. Concorde's fastest transatlantic crossing was on February 7th, 1996, when it completed New York to London in two hours, 52 minutes, 59 seconds. Whoa. So under three hours. New York to London, wow. Usually it takes eight hours. Yeah. See, so you are flying, both literally and figuratively. Uh, because of speed and the time difference between the cities, it was possible that the London to New York flight would land before it departed. Oh, I love that. A little bit of time travel. Yeah, that's fun. Whoa. Whoa. Pretty cool. That ha- that happens on the on the Australia to America for I think. Melbourne to LA, I think yeah. that happens. Yeah. Or often you, what do you land at a similar time and you go, oh. Oh. But then on the way back you you lose a day that you never get back. You never get back. I know. I'm I'm flying to Honolulu and I get there the before I've left on the same day, but on the way back lose an entire day. And you never get that back. Yeah. It's gone, Jess. Wow. Let it go. I don't think I can. Move on. What could have happened on that day? I'm not going to tell you. All my dreams could have come true on that day. Dave and I will experience it. We'll experience your dreams coming true. Yeah. Do you want us to keep a diary? Yeah, if you could. Send it to you. Just of that day. Tell you what you missed out on. Yes, please. Dear diary. Does that mean like All news? All Jess's dreams came true. <laughs> <laughs> news and current events um, don't happen for me that day. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. You're also actually a day younger, so now your birthday is, what, August 25? Oh, my God. I'm even older than you now. Well, you're August 27. 27, yeah, okay. Wow. 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 So, if anything, it's bringing you and I closer. That's all I've ever wanted. Wow. So, that is my dreams coming true. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, it all sounds pretty great, right? The speed. Yeah. All that sort of stuff. I mean, yeah. Are there TV screens? Uh, I is don't think there were originally... Some sort of entertainment or what's the food service like? The food service was incredible. Five, You get a five-course meal. Legit. Really? Yeah. Which I will talk about. But Fuck yeah, great. The service was phenomenal. Oh, cool. All right. So it sounds great. And the right? tickets cost a fortune, I'm imagining. Incredible amounts. I'll talk about okay. that as well. Okay. But incredible engineering and ingenuity meant Concorde travelled faster than normal planes, which yep. is great. But it did have its drawbacks. One of the byproducts of supersonic flight is the very loud noise of a sonic boom, oh. which can be unpleasant or distressing to those on the ground. And in some cases, it can cause damage to windows and structures. Well, on the ground. Yeah, the force is so Whoa. strong. It's amazing. Maybe another reason why they have to be so high. Well, what is a sonic boom and what causes it? Well, let me <laughs> let boomsupersonic.com answer that question. Boom supersonic. <laughs> Love it. Supersonic boom. Here that we go. Been better. <laughs> <laughs> Pressure waves, aka sound waves, propagate at the speed of sound. When an aircraft is moving faster than the speed of sound, which is breaking the sound barrier, the pressure waves do not propagate in front of the aircraft, but rather create a wave similar to the wake of a boat yep. that follows along with the aircraft. And a sonic boom is that sound wave passing by the observer. So if you're up there, you're not getting that bit, but you're on the ground. If the plane goes overhead, it goes... And it's like a... It's a big sound. It's quite loud. And it's just doing that mm. constantly over everyone it passes. Yeah. That sounds... Yeah. That doesn't sound ideal. As a result, many countries banned Concorde from flying over their cities, including the USA, which ultimately limited the routes to being over water with minimal time spent soaring over land. So, for example, New York to LA flights are impossible. So... So it's not even like it's a it's a once off kind of thing. It continues to ripple behind it. I think it's like a boom. Everything it sort of touches. Yeah, and it's sort of like as it flies past, you hear you'll hear it do a boom, but then you know someone a couple of k over there when it flies over them, they'll hear a boom. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Boom, 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 boom. I want you in my room. They wrote that about. Yeah. Um, Sonic boom. Inspired. Sonic boom. Yeah. Yeah, people don't give Venga Boys enough credit. That was Venga Boys. Bloody hell, that's good. There's a lot of um, a lot of very topical <laughs> references in their music. For sure. And people are just like, it's just fun dance party music. It's like, it's so much more than that. It's, it's funny that a band that, that travelled exclusively by bus was writing about the Concorde. Yeah. Well, they were just, I mean, you know, they were looking out their bus window. Yeah. Hey, what's that? <laughs> boom. Yeah. Well, if they were in the Concorde, they wouldn't be hearing the boom, 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 boom. That's right. 
And they wouldn't want you in their room. Let's spend the night together together from now and to (laughs) forever. Isn't isn't the human brain fascinating? (laughs) The things it holds on to. (laughs) Yes, like would not have heard that song in a long time. What about the ad that you referenced before? Surely (laughs) you haven't heard that. Yeah, that's true. Not since I was a kid. (laughs) They used to play that at Waverley Park, which is now houses. Yeah, (laughs) it doesn't exist. And they still play it. It's (laughs) very annoying to live there. So in America, you couldn't fly overland. So New York to LA, not possible. But you could fly from New York to London or Paris because most of the journey is over the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, okay. These limitations had a big effect on demand for the SSTs. 16 airlines initially placed orders for the Concorde, totaling about 100 planes. Wow. Qantas, which is Australia's national carrier, initially down for six. Six. Give us six. Wow. Said out, Mr. out of how Qantas. many? Out of 100. Yeah, right. 6%. That's a, that's a lot. That's quick maths. <laughs> I did it! The 1973 oil crisis had many airlines cautious about aircraft with high fuel consumption rates, and the 747 was launched around the same time. While slower, they were a much lower risk option for airlines as they consumed heaps less fuel. Yeah, okay. And in the 70s when Concord was taking off, so was the idea of being more environmentally conscious. They only started thinking about that in the 70s. People were waking up to the fact that these planes were fuel guzzlers and this led the planes to often being greeted with protesters. Like a Concord would land and people would say, this is not sustainable. Mm. But boo. look how fast it is. They'd say, boo, 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 boo. 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 <laughs> I want you out of the air, <laughs> etc. Mm-hmm. You know the rest. Sing that alone at home. <laughs> There was a real concern that if every plane flew supersonic as they wanted them to, that the environmental effects could be detrimental. Over time, it was also discovered that Concorde's engines produced much more sulfuric acid particles than the exhaust of subsonic aircraft, and this sulfuric acid damaged the ozone layer. Ooh. And I have read reports that they've worked out that if every plane had gone supersonic, by now we would have destroyed the ozone layer. Holy wow. shit. Yep. Bit of luck they figured that out. Yeah. Also, to add to the woes of Concorde's early developments were the costs were much more than expected to make them. Mm. Spiralling during development to more than six times the original projections. In the end, each plane cost £23 million in 1977, which is just under £150 million in today's money. British Airways and Air France were basically only able to afford to run them because the governments of each country footed the bill. British Airways bought some Concords from the government for a symbolic price of one pound. Hmm. That's, a good, that's a good deal. That's a good deal. I'd that take that a good deal. deal. If, that ha- if they said to me today, you can have a Concord for one pound, I'd say yes, please. Okay. Yeah, I'd, well, I'd want to look at the paperwork. Yeah, but actually. I'd say, current, would you take 90p? What's the current conversion? Like AUD, one yeah. pound could that, be, that could be absolutely that 250, something like breaking that? us. What's that about buck 60, you reckon? Buck Ooh. 60? Jeez, I don't know. That's not bad. I don't know if I can handle that. Dollar seventy five. It's gone up to. All right. Would you pay a dollar seventy five for a Concorde? Maybe. Maybe, but where am I going to park it? Mm. Yeah. yeah they're they're not that big. Remember. Bit of street parking around here. But <laughs> Get a permit. Oh, I could park it in the park across the road. On the roof. On the roof, of course. Keep it out of the way. That's wasted real estate right now. Mm. Yeah. Remember how I said initially they had orders for a hundred. Yeah. In the end, only 20 Concords were built, oh. with six being prototypes. So only 14 were used for passengers. All oh, right. And Qantas had them all. <laughs> we good didn't, for us. We got none. Oh. Tragic. Only but it seems like maybe that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. We we're already damaging our ozone down here. Yeah. yeah. Pretty good. There's a hole in ours. So they were few in number, but fly they did. <laughs> However, the Soviet built. Tupolev Tu-144, the Terminator, beat them to the punch by conducting their first flight on the 31st of December 1968. Mm. The Concorde made its successful flight just over two months later on March 2nd, 1969. Nice. nice. <laughs> they waited for a much nicer year. Yeah. I, I mean, if the Russians good. had waited one day. Yeah, not even nice. a day. Yeah. Fools. Uh, the Tu-144 first went supersonic on the 5th of June 1969. Four months before Concorde, and on the 26th of May 1970, became the world's first commercial transport to exceed Mark II. Wow. So they're beating Concorde just each of these milestones. 
They're the first to go supersonic, but they were also the first in the bitter rivalry to do what no one wanted to do. Crash. Oh, oh no. At the 1973 Paris Air Show, both aircraft were due to exhibit. To quote from the plane website again, wikipedia.org. What a great website. So good. All about planes. So good. I imagine the w part is short for wings. Yeah. Wings. Wings Wikipedia. Yeah. Wingipedia. Oh, that was taken. Ah, uh, yeah. So you got to go wiki. Close enough. Now uh, to quote from this, uh, the Soviet pilot Mikhail Kozlov had bragged that he would outperform the Concorde. Just wait until you see us fly, he was quoted as saying. Then you'll see something. Oh, dear. <laughs> On the final day of the show, the Concorde, which was not yet in proper production, performed its f- demonstration flight first. They went first. Its performance was later described as being unexciting. It basically went up and then came down. It's been theorised that Kozlov, the Soviet pilot, was determined to show how much better his aircraft was. Uh, End quote there. Once in flight, the aircraft made what appeared to be a landing approach with the landing gear out, but then with all four engines at full power, climbed rapidly. He wanted to put on a show. Okay. Possibly stalling below 2,000 feet or 600 metres, the aircraft pitched over and went into a steep dive. Oh, no. Trying to pull out of the subsequent dive with the engines again at full power, the TU-144 broke up in midair, possibly due to overstressing the frame. The left wing came away first, and then the aircraft disintegrated and crashed, destroying 15 houses (gasps) on the ground, killing all six people on board the plane and eight more on the ground. Oh, my God. And this is at a big air show where... Hundreds of thousands of people watching. Yeah. So that's the the Russian version of a the Soviet version, the TR20 yeah. Twenty or whatever. And it it's um, did it did they look very similar? And that's sort of like, it's a similar design. So they sort of principle, yeah. They yeah. came up like because they were doing the same tests. They both were coming to the same conclusions. Basically, basically, yeah. This is the best aerodynamic shape. Right. So it really just came down to the pilot being going for a bit too much. Uh, in that instance, uh, yes, but I I don't think their engines were... The big difference was the engines. Right. Oh, that's... Yeah, so he was sort of like, give them a show. Yeah. Let's do something flashy. It was, yeah, for example, I'm just going to suddenly go up in the air. Yeah. And it was... And then the engine stalled and then he had to go full power to try and not crash. Oh. Yeah. And that was too much for the plane and it shook it apart. Far oh, out. Man. That's yeah. full on. And so everybody on board's killed eight people. Eight people and on the ground. houses. A lot of people watching. This is a big news story. Yeah, that's. The crash reduced Russian airline Aeroflot's enthusiasm for the TU 144. And another crash in 1978 ended any chance of it being used as a passenger plane. Oh. The TU 144 remained in commercial service as a cargo aircraft. Until its cancellation in 1983. It feels like it feels wasted as a cargo aircraft, don't you reckon? Yeah, it's so. Like, oh, we'll, we'll we'll just use it to like I don't know, send mail around or send yeah, some shit. It's because it's, it's fast, but like again, they're not that big. Yeah, they're not. They can't carry much. Does sound like it was for the best. Like if it was real successful, it would have done all the dam like oh, more yeah. ozone damage. And I mean, obviously, not ideal for the people who died. Mm. Um, of course, but yeah. But it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's such a strange thing. I, it, so it's just, it's the kind of thing that's just not possible to have, if they stuck with it, they could never have developed it so that it would have been more environmentally friendly and that sort oh, of may- stuff. Maybe because I, I guess no- normal jet planes are still pretty. They are bad for the environment. For the yes. environment so. But what about like instead of okay, supersonics are not great with c- very noisy and uh, all this stuff. Why don't we just work on making planes faster? Yeah, mark just do that. one and a bit. Yeah, like just sort of, you know, middle ground. Yeah. Compromise. Or is that what they've done? Yeah, planes faster. Planes are quicker now. Like when you get the A380, the, Air, the big Airbus with the two levels, I think yeah. they fly faster than a right. 747. Something about having stairs in them makes them go faster. You know, yeah. you can go upstairs <laughs> and yeah. you're like, what the fuck? I mean, we obviously can't go upstairs but um we see them as yeah. we uh we see the velvet rope as we walk as past, we walk past. As upstairs the fancy so. yeah wow 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 pretty cool huh that is so cool <laughs> that is so cool <laughs> one day oh imagine nah, definitely not i just i still don't get the you know, just have to have so much money to think yeah. that it's worth because those tickets business class or first class is like you know it's like 10 times as much right oh, it's, or something. it's so much more so you'd have to have You'd have to just have too much money to know what to do with it, I yeah. think. Yeah, we had a family friend who in retirement did quite a bit of travelling and said to me one time, and I was like 
late teens, he was sort of like, oh, you know, if you're gonna tra- if you're gonna travel overseas, do it first class. And I was like, wow. you and I are in very different <laughs> financial situations, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> What do you mean? So you're telling an 18 year old that. Yeah. And I'm like, Ian, what are you yeah, talking nah, about? That's, like, that's a whole like a year of backpacking budget. It's crazy. On return flights. Just so that you can lie down and have it. It's like, well, I'll sleep when I get there, yeah. I reckon. I'm, Ian, you mad dog. I know. What a way to. But I mean, like, if you can afford it, sure, I guess go for it. But it's, I'd rather spend that money on other things. Because you're probably like those, I guess they're all, um, uh, what do you call it? Counteracting our cheap flights. Yeah. Yeah. Sub, what am I saying? Sub, they're subsidising. Subsidising, yeah. yeah. Oh, right. I think I saw some maths on how much they make per seat. And yeah, I think it is sim- similar to that. Like, you know, they charge these in crazy ticket prices so they can make a profit. Yeah, but yeah. but you're right. If you're paying $25,000 to fly overseas, wild. Yeah, and that's that's before you got there. Like you could spend twenty five grand on the whole trip and have a, an incredible time, like do some real flashy stuff, but you're spending that just to get there. That is the life I want to lead, my friend. <laughs> Ian, get me in Ian. there. Ian, is Ian single? Lovely man. No, unfortunately, married to Faye for a very long time. A beautiful couple. Was Faye up the back? Love them dearly. No, no, no. Both in first class. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeez. I know. Double the ticket. They live a good life. So the TU-144 crashed, it was highly publicised and it had an effect on people's enthusiasm for Concorde and was also another reason that other airlines pulled out of purchasing them. So now they basically got three strikes. Yeah. They're very loud and you can't fly them everywhere. They cost a fortune, which is, I mean, it was four strikes. Uh, the safety's now been called into question. Yeah. So it's like, oh, okay. This isn't good. And also the fuel is very expensive. But they look cool. They look great. <laughs> So, in the end, it was just British Airways and Air France, and they soldiered on together. The only two people. Very Only brave. two uh, carriers. Hmm. On January 21st, 1976, two Concords, one from each airline, took off simultaneously to mark the plane's first supersonic passenger flight. A team of about 250 British Airways engineers had worked around the clock to ensure safety on board. Concorde was subjected to another 5,000 hours of testing before it was certified for passenger flight, making it the most tested aircraft ever. Wow. So they were, they were pretty confident they were safe. So what's it like on board? Oh, I want to hear about this five-course meal. So it had about 100 seats for passengers, 40 in the front cabin and 60 in the rear cabin. So it's front like business class or... They were, I actually read an interview with someone who said all the seats are the same. But there was like this mental thing about flying up the front where you felt fancier than in the back, even though there's one class for all. Yeah, it's which no, is they're no different. Extremely wealthy. So, but do the do the front section do they cost any more? Are they the same? No, it's the same. But, but people you, still want to get in the you front. You want to get up the, the further up. It's the, back the opposite of like being in the back of the bus is cool. I think it's the same. Yeah, it's yeah, still you're nerds right. at the front. Yeah. <laughs> they've just got money. <laughs> they're, they're yeah, you're rich, right. But they're all nerds. Rich yeah. nerds. All rich people. <laughs> There were two rows of two with an aisle down the middle. The bucket seats were pretty small too, similar in size to to today's economy seats. They didn't have very like they didn't have big recliners or anything, but they were made of leather. Okay, so I mean, you say that like it's luxurious, but it just means if you're wearing shorts or a dress, you're uncomfortable because you're sticking to the chair the whole time. And, it, and what Especially if, if they're parked in the sun while you're at the oh beach. Oh my god, it's the worst! You got to t- put the towel down. <laughs> yeah, and just then, to make the drive home. And, and the buckles. Just so hot, it so burns hot. you as soon as it touches your skin. Oh my god, you get third degree burns from the from the seatbelt. Can you, yeah, come pick me up in the Concorde, yeah, just down at just down at uh, Half Moon Bay. So. <laughs> uh, the plane was serviced by six crew members. Okay. Uh, because Concorde guzzled six thousand seven hundred and seventy gallons of fuel per hour. Per hour. It's so wild, and capacity was limited to just a hundred. Tickets were very, very expensive. This meant that the Concorde was largely reserved for the rich and famous, lots of wealthy business execs okay. needing to travel fast, or people who had saved up the money for years just to experience wow. supersonic travel. I don't think I don't think I care that much. I know. I think that yeah, t- that's interesting. People like real plane nerds. Who, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can understand that, but yeah, that would be... They're, they're going without a holiday for 10 years just so they can get yeah, one. Yeah, and, and I that, guess, yeah. And the holiday, once they get there, is just... It's like it's in dorm, dorm room. They're yeah. like 50-year-old guys in, in like <laughs> backpackers. 12-bed yeah. backpacker dorms. <laughs> but he's having a great time. And they're all going, can't wait till the flight home. <laughs> How good was that flight? They're all high-fiving. Yeah. 
<laughs> I guess like, yeah, I guess I like to spend my money on experiences and that's, that's an experience. If that's, yeah, if that's what you're excited yeah, about. Yeah, people love it. Cool. There was but a, how much was it? Oh, it hasn't oh, said yet. It hasn't price. said yet. He's, I think he's holding oh it. Oh, my God. It better be it's impressive It's building now. up real yeah. big in my mind. <laughs> so, there weren't TVs, but uh, they did have a fun display on the plane showing passengers the speed the plane was traveling, and people would apparently applaud when it hit Mark 1 and then Mark 2. That was a big part of I'm it. I'm imagining it like a, like a flip clock, that sort of... Yeah, going... Yeah, yeah, and they'll go... Oh! That's, That's what I'm Isn't it funny that how much people would, would have spent back then to fly on a modern plane oh, in, yeah. in just the cheap seats in economy? Yeah. It's got, you can pick a movie. Yeah. You can play games. How much does this cost? Are oh, they the cheap seats? This is a pillow for me. <laughs> <laughs> a hot towel. <laughs> oh, I love a hot towel. I love them at first and then they go cold so quickly and you're left sort of holding it. Yeah, going, I don't get it. Do I, do I don't really get it. Yeah. What do I do with this? <laughs> What do I do with this? I wiped my face. That felt good. Now I'm holding it. Now, there was one <laughs> person at some point thought that was good. Yeah. And they've just stuck with it. I reckon it's it's like a cheap, like faux piece of luxury. Like you yeah. go, oh, yeah, I don't get this yeah. anywhere else. But you think about it, you go, they just microwaved like a hundred towels at once. Yeah. Okay. Sorry to spoil that for you, No, Jess. you know what? Because I don't necessarily like them on planes. I think what I'm thinking of is like if you go and get a facial and when they're taking the product off your face, they put a hot towel on to get off. And that's nice. But you don't have to hold the towel yeah. and deal with it. They just put it away. Oh, the, your, your, your servants <laughs> deal with that, do they, Jess? <laughs> that's not a my concern. <laughs> Take it away. Get the towel you away from it, me. Throw it on the floor. Yeah. And now pick it up. They're like, you took that from me to throw it. <laughs> But I, I was going to put it away. You're a nightmare. Yeah, that's why I'm not allowed back at the Indota Spa. <laughs> Indota. <laughs> uh, to cater for their wealthy clientele, the Concorde fleet was stocked with fine champagne and beluga caviar. La de frickin' da. This was followed by a five-course gourmet meal. It's Thanks. beluga. That's like beluga whale's eggs, is it? Is that what beluga caviar is? Yeah, well, it's yes, yeah, fish eggs, yeah. Wow. Whales aren't fish, though. What are, are beluga whales even a thing? Yeah. Yeah, that is a thing. Beluga caviar. I think I that's what beluga means. Anything to do with Baloo from the Jungle Book and sp- Tailspin? Fuck it. Fuck it. about this guy. Oh, fuck it. Shut your lid, you uh, toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Shut it. Uh, uh, beluga caviar is caviar consisting of the roe or eggs of the beluga sturgeon. Ah. Uh, fish. It is a fish. Found primarily in the Caspian Sea. Matt, it is a fish. It is a fish. A mackerel fish. So, a five-course meal. Yes, apparently you would get uh, things like lobster and things served Far up to you. Far out. And c- because the flight wasn't that long, apparently people were eating like the whole flight. We just kept bringing out food. That's the way I like to fly. Just keep eating. Yeah, you don't it's need to snacks. watch something you're eating. You're yeah. busy eating. Busy eating. Normally, you, you're like, oh, you want seafood when you're in a seaside town because you know it's fresh. Up in the sky, I'd be wanting to eat birds, you know? <laughs> if you're on a plane, <laughs> give me some quail. Do they yeah. fly? Pigeons, you know? <laughs> give me some what, pigeons. What have you got in the way yeah. of seagulls? I mean, you're, yeah. not, you're not going inland and going to the fish and chip shop. No, yeah. you wouldn't. You got a magpie? Yeah. I'll eat it. Here's a magpie. Give me a magpie pie. Huh? Oh, hey, got my attention. I know. The few times that they've served pies on planes, I absolutely what loved a it. what a perfect, perfect dish for the sky. Exactly, heat it up. Pie in the sky. Pie in the sky. Oh gosh, it's just. I'm, I'm so with you. I mean, should we send an email to Qantas? I think so, and just say you fucking idiots. You fuck. <laughs> That'll get their attention. You. Fucked yeah, that's up. oh, that's the subject. You fuck. Oh, better click this one. I've done something <laughs> oh, wrong. Oh. Who's the Oy, head of Joyce. Qantas? Helen Joyce. Yeah. yeah. Alan. I'm disappointed in you. Uh, Alan, we need to talk Alan, about you. You Irish men <laughs> coming over here. Yeah. Taking our multi million dollar CEO jobs. Yeah. Hey, that could have been me. Could have been me. And could've you know been. what I would have done? What I would have done, Alan? Would have put a pie in that sky. Would have put a bloody pie in that sky, Alan. What hey, are you doing? Do you what not you doing, have pies Alan? in Ireland? I think you do, Alan. Pyland. Pyland. Are you ashamed of your culture? Because you shouldn't be a beautiful country. What are an Irish stew pie? Delicious. Oh, yes, a beef and Guinness. Beef and Guinness please. pie. Come on. Alan. 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 Don't be ashamed of where you come from, Alan. Maybe put some veggies in one of them. Huh. 
I think, huh. we, I think, huh. we, I think we just got banned for life from Qantas. That'd be stupid. It's okay. I can't afford to fly Qantas. <laughs> Qantas, Dave. <laughs> Jesus come on. Christ. Jetstar or bust for me. <laughs> and I'm not happy about that. It's just the way I have to live. Tiger? Oh, sometimes when you're desperate. <laughs> Uh, Despite the cramped quarters, Concord was seen as fit for a king or queen. Thank you. Uh, Queen Elizabeth II first travelled on the Concord in 1977. Oh, you weren't calling me a queen. No, sorry, I was talking about the queen. Could you Uh, call me a queen? Yes, queen. (laughs) The airliner was also used for trips to Barbados in 1987. Wow. 2003 for the queen. And as well as a visit to the Middle East in 1984 and to the United States in 1991. So the Queen, she's all over it. Was wow. she sitting in there with some guy who just saved up all his money for yeah. <laughs> 15 years? <laughs> Imagine that. Oh, Queen, yeah, you love planes too. Oh, oh wow. my God. Or Let's just, look at that dial. Or does she like rent out the whole plane? I reckon she rented out the whole plane. when he rented out the whole cinema in Annie? What? <laughs> okay, that is, I would say, less expensive. Really? I think so. A whole cinema? <laughs> <laughs> it's got more seats, I guess, isn't yeah. it? When you rent a cinema, do you have to pay for every seat? Every seat. Do they assume that that, cin- that movie would have been full? Yeah. And so therefore you Pretty arrogant on their part, all. right? I've never been in a full cinema. Well, we rent- That's not true, I have. We rented a cinema about five months ago. Yeah, how much was we that? I don't know. It wasn't oh, full though, I worked, was it? I worked it all out. Do we have to pay for those empty seats? Do we pay for those empty seats? Yeah. Is it like a wedding? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Now, I mentioned Concorde in my fairly recent Live Aid episode as Phil Collins flew on the aircraft between the UK and America so that he could perform at both the London and Philadelphia concerts. Oh. Now, was, is there a dress code or is it no jacket required? <laughs> <laughs> that was the longest it's taken you to hate yourself after a joke. Like you were happy with it. For no, the that, most was part. Bu- that was a build-up of everything I've said today. <laughs> and then we were laughing, and then you hated it. It's but, not um, like we gave you nothing. Oh, that no, was good I stuff. Know. But as the as the sonic boom <laughs> went past, they could uh, feel it coming in the air tonight. <laughs> that's, uh, that's for sure. <laughs> it was it was on the Concord map. Might remember it, Jess. You went there. I'm not sure if you actually bothered to go back and listen to my three hours spectacular, but. Um, <laughs> It was on the Concord that he met Cher, who asked if she could join the concert. Uh, so the Queen, Phil Collins and Cher, these are the kind of people who flew on Concord. Oh, man. I want to do a report on Cher. The Queen, Phil Collins and uh, Elizabeth II. <laughs> <laughs> the Queen bows down, my lady. <laughs> According to Bob van der Linden. Good name. Great name. From the Smithsonian, he said... the. Aeroplane usually flew with lots of empty seats just because it was too expensive. And each unsold seat was more money lost by the airline. And because the Concorde was uh, such a hyped experience, they had to keep a spare Concorde at the airport in New York City so that if there was any mechanical problems with the lead plane, the passengers could go on the backup one. That makes sense, I guess. Because you don't want to like... It's like when I hired a convertible Mustang and they (laughs) they said, oh, sorry, we, we don't have any Mustangs. But we're going to give you a free upgrade to a Nissan Maxima. <laughs> <laughs> Let me talk to the manager. I might see if we can get a sunroof. <laughs> and Instead of with a straight it? face. I don't think Mustangs are special in America. That's so funny. That is great. Oh, you wanted to have this uh, beautiful road trip in a in a fun car? Well, I can. I can. Uh, I, I might be, not be able to give you fun, but I can give you safe. Yeah. And family friendly. So we don't have uh, the Concords actually out of action, but we can upgrade you all to a Nissan Maxima. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a little longer, but we'll, we'll make sure we've got a sunroof. We will upgrade okay, you. Okay, that should be fine. <laughs> we'll upgrade you to a six course meal <laughs> yeah. for the inconvenience. Imagine having to tell the Queen that her flight's delayed or something. God, that wouldn't feel good, would it? No. Especially if it was like weather related and you're like, I'm so sorry, I cannot control that. But can you? Can you by any chance? Surely. My lady. You were chosen by God, I heard. <laughs> I, it's funny because you two love the Queen. I'd, I'd love it. It could, wouldn't give me any more satisfaction to be like, sorry, Liz. <laughs> yeah, a bit of a delay. Yeah, no, probably be another 20 to 40 hours. So. But you're a servant of ours, aren't you? Yeah. Really? Could you give me a cup of tea? So. I think you, I mean, you wouldn't expect any special treatment, would you? <laughs> Just because you were born into a weird family? That'd be, be pretty ridiculous, wouldn't it, Liz? <laughs> it's too much hey. to ask, Liz. 
You're not stupid, are you, Liz? <laughs> huh? Hey, Liz, you stupid? <laughs> That's how you're talking to the queen. Huh? huh? Nah, you're right, Liz, aren't you? Nah, good on you. Trying to do a selfie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, if they have the backup plane sitting there, that's not flying. That's empty. That's costing more money. Uh, so a ticket for a one-way transatlantic flight at the end of the nineties, yeah, was six thousand US dollars. One way. One way. Six thousand US end of the nineties. Yeah, so yeah, that's re- that's so expensive now for a one-way flight. Oh yeah. But back then, I'm guessing that's like twenty grand in today's money. Having an absolute stab at it. Yeah. One way. Yeah. So, so it's, it's like very a, expensive. Yeah. It's a, you know, a year's of minimum wages for a return flight. Yeah. It's not worth it. So it was costly, but what could be seen as a selling point for decades was Concorde had a sparkling safety record. Ah, they did not crash. Similar to Qantas, according to Rain Man. <laughs> yeah. How was that movie? Uh, flying at such an altitude, passengers rarely experience turbulence. So it was also smoother, safe, fast, smooth. Honestly, that sounds like the best way to fly. And do other things. <laughs> get in, get out. Safe, fast, smooth. When when was the um, when was it six thousand? Nine. End, end of the nineties. Jinx. Oh, buy me a coke. Buy me a coke. No. I don't drink coke. You buy me a coke. Buy me a Pepsi. Okay. I don't drink Pepsi. Okay. What do you oh, want then? I'll okay. buy you an orange juice. Thank you. <laughs> oh, this is US dollars, Matthew. What? Yes, Matthew. Uh, let's have a look here, eh? Uh, oh, it's, uh, it's only about... It's 10,200 according to uh, dollartimes.com. Really and that's, I, oh, it's still expensive. I thought it'd be more, but when you do think about it, for a one-way years. flight, that's insane. Yeah. 10,000 US dollars. Yeah, so what's that's that? crazy. 14,000 Australian dollars. Yeah. So 28,000 Australian dollars for a return flight. Nah, that's... Nah. <laughs> it's a no from you? That's a no from me. <laughs> what do you reckon? Did, mm. did Ian ever fly? Well, I'm going to crunch some numbers. I don't think so. should ask Ian. Ian, yeah, I'm sure he was on there. I, I mean, I could afford the cash, but I, I don't think I'd... Morally, I just couldn't. That's, that's my Environmentally? Yeah, yeah, environmentally, I couldn't. Yeah. No, and no, I appreciate that, yeah. So, it was very safe for decades, and that was honestly a point of pride and a, and a thing that people saw... For a, decades. As an advantage. Oh, no, that has Tragically, that perfect safety record came to an end on the 25th of July, 2000. Oh, this is so recent, and I don't remember no. any of this. I, re- I vaguely remember like being in the news that when it, there was its last flight at some point. Oh. But I don't know when, but it feels like maybe 15 years ago or something. But yeah, right. But you don't remember the 25th of July, 19, no. uh, 2000? Because I mean, I was nine. There is a very famous photo and video of what I'm about to describe. Okay. There was another plane incident a year later that probably overshadowed it. In yeah. Our memories. Oh, 25th of July, 2001. Uh, what are you... <laughs> A year and a bit. A year and a bit. A year and a bit. Okay, well, be specific, Matt. (laughs) Otherwise, we don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) Imagine being that pedantic. Oh, actually, I didn't think that was a year. I thought that was a little bit longer than a year. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's it's interesting. Oh, you can't use... Quite differently to I. To I. (laughs) What sort of calendar are you running over there? Probably not Gregorian by the yeah, sound of it. Jeez, okay. I mean, you live your life however you want to live, yeah. but I live by the Gregorian. Yeah. <laughs> Stuart calendar has approximately six weeks longer than a normal calendar. Huh. Interesting. There you go. Yeah, or you're just a good dude. Yeah. <laughs> I, I live my life by Greg and his teachings, calendar wise. <laughs> <laughs> so, flight 4590 was a charter flight from Paris to New York City. Most of the passengers were German tourists on their way to board a Caribbean bound cruise ship. God, they're having a good time, aren't they? Flying yeah. from Paris to New York to then get on a cruise ship. Yeah. Ah. It was a full flight with 100 passengers on board, as well as six flight staff and three crew in the cockpit, who were flight engineer Gilles Jardineau, who was 58 and had been with Air France since 1968. Wow. He got three decades under his belt. He's the one operating and monitoring the plane's complex systems. These days, most large modern aircraft no longer have a flight engineer as it's mostly monitored by computers. Yep. But back then they did. There was also First Officer Jean Marco, who was 50 and had been with Air France since 1971. Wow, so they're, yeah, they're joining young. Yeah, and Early they've been around for, for a long time. And the captain was Christian Marty, who was 53 and had been with Air France since 1967. Captain Marty. 
Captain. I like that. You like this guy? He As was. This is uh, Captain Matty speaking. Bonjour, passengers. Is Bonjour. he French? <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, oui. Oh, oui. Mesdames et messieurs. Eh. <laughs> you are very good at that. Prepare day. the cockpit for landing. It gets me every time. It's so funny. And then, you know what else gets me every time we're on a plane? Is um, how angry Matt gets every time they interrupt. Uh, it, it comes up on his screen. He's watching Cars 2 for the fourth time. <laughs> it comes up. No. In, in Incredibles 2. <laughs> it comes up that, like, announcement in program and he just, fuck, he gets so upset. You're about 13 Such seconds into the movie. Such a chilled, mellow person and that just makes him so angry and what it's are very they, funny. I just don't understand why they yeah. think it has to interrupt. If it, and it's... It's always like, ah, oh, just letting you know that yeah. everything's fine. It could well, be you don't interrupt my movie to yeah. tell me that. Maybe but- it could be like um, sometimes, you know, you're in the car and you've got like GPS and music going and it just sort of, it comes up over the top of the music. Maybe it just does that. Yeah. So you can hear the announcement still. Yeah. But it doesn't have to interrupt. And you can pause if you want. Yeah. Anyway, it's very funny. Sorry, you said I'd like Captain oh, Marty. Oh, Captain Marty. He was also, so as well as being three decades as a pilot, he was also the first person to windsurf across the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. What, what? What? I like Marty. Jeez. Which he achieved. Jeez, in- isn't that You're really relying on where the wind's blowing to. Yeah. Right? He did it in 1982 after windsurfing across 37 days. Wow. What would he do? Like, you're not just in the middle of the ocean. What would you do? Do they have a boat with him? I guess that they have a well, boat. Just sleep it on the wind. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, because I, I feel that you'd be so isolated without yeah. a without a support boat. Yeah. That's incredible. Apparently, he did lots of extreme stuff on the weekend. Extreme <laughs> windsurfing. So, <laughs> so between them, these three men had logged I over. I can't picture windsurfing without like fluoro colors and an 80s soundtrack. Yeah. And this guy's doing it in the 80s. He's, this is yeah. peak Wind- windsurfing. <laughs> <laughs> This is the best. He's wearing those, those uh, those sunglasses. Yeah, yeah. he's got With a the windbreaker, s- the strap. Yes, <laughs> holding the sun. Makes it fall off. He's got zinc across his nose. Yeah, oh, that's <sighs> sick. Per <laughs> mullet, love it. So between them, these three men had locked o- logged over thirty six thousand hours of flying hours. Wow, they're all experts in the field. You know, ten thousand hours, all that. So they were very experienced, and to be even flying Concord. They had to be considered elite in their fields. Yeah. Well, there's only 14 of these things on Earth. So yeah. if you're flying one of them, you're you're very experienced. Sort of a one-day ace kind of type. Yeah, yeah, ace. What happened? To, was there a one-day ace at the start of this episode? Yeah. yeah. What happened to him? Charles Yeager. He went faster than the speed of sound. Right. Remember that guy? <laughs> Sorry, this is a long one. <laughs> uh, before that day, this particular aeroplane they were on had flown for 11,900 hours and they had... 4,873 takeoff and landing cycles. Pretty reliable machine. Okay. No issues. Yep. At approximately 4.43 in the afternoon, the plane began its takeoff from Charles de Gaulle Airport. Oh, I've just remembered this is a bad story. I know, because you're going like very experienced pilots. Yeah. Yep. Um, plane is in good nick. This sound, Everything sounds like it's going... It's going to be absolutely fine. Plan. These planes, if you're getting on it, they've never killed anyone before. So you're going... This Sweet. This is very safe. Yeah, I'm okay. The cockpit crew did their usual checks and all looked good, so they took off down the runway. They did everything by the book perfect. Everything was normal and as it should be until a bang was felt on the plane and it began veering left. On the runway? Yep. The crew didn't know this, but what had happened was the Concorde's front tyre had been cut. Cut? The tyre sort of exploded and a large chunk of tyre debris, which was... Four and a half kilos or just under 10 pounds was sent smashing into the underside of the left wing at an estimated speed of 140 meters per second. Four. 300 miles per hour. Whoa. So it just exploded and then smashed into the. So plane. they're already. They're, they're, they're ru- flying up the runway. Yeah, going really, really quick. Shit. Fuel. So, and the tire exploded. Fuel tank five had been ruptured in the process, which sent kerosene gushing out and it was ignited. Oh. Probably by electrical wiring that had been cut by the tyre. Air traffic controller Gilles Logelin was in the Charles de Gaulle airport watching on and he was the first to notice flames trailing from behind as it hurtled down the runway. Even at a distance, it was clear that something had gone horribly wrong. Within a split second, a massive line of flames trailed the plane. He radioed to the pilot about the fire, instructing them to abort takeoff but by that time, it was too late. The plane had just hit V1 or decision speed, which means they were traveling too fast oh. to abort the takeoff. They had to try and take off or they'd run out of runway and they were guaranteed to crash. So they have to now 
get up in the get air. Get up in the air to get back down yeah, on the ground. okay, yeah. Because if you keep going... You can't just go, boop, sorry about that, no, actually. No, because you, you'll definitely crash if that yeah, happens. Okay. Like George Michael said, you got to get up to get down in this case. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Did he say that? Where's the live five? <laughs> got to get up to get down. Is that... Yeah. Feels like something he would say. <laughs> I know you're a fan. If you don't know it, then no That is will. him. Uh, I think you're amazing. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so, decisions B. They've got to get off the ground. Yeah. They get off the ground, but engines one and two both surged and lost all power. Oof. And then engine one slowly recovered over the next few seconds. The plane struggled to gain enough airspeed for a controlled takeoff as it was unable to climb as the landing gear bay door had been damaged and they were unable to retract the landing gear. Okay. Which makes you much less aerodynamic. Yeah, right. The experience Which is crew, crazy, isn't it? That like one thing can't come up and it's like, oh, now we're fucked. Yeah, now it like throws the dyna- aerodynamics off completely. That's incredible. The experienced crew, who re- incredibly remained quite calm throughout, in fact, very calm, tried to troubleshoot the problem because they didn't know why, but the landing gear won't go up. So they're trying all different things to try and get it to go up. They radioed the tower to inform them that they were going to try and divert and land at paris Lou bourget Airport, which is nearby. Mm-hmm. But an uneven amount of thrust on either side of the aircraft caused by engine one and two not working meant the plane banked 100 degrees, so it was uneven because the planes on on one wing are working, but the planes on the other aren't working. Sorry, the engines on the other wing aren't working. Okay, So yeah, they're yep. uneven in the sky. Yeah. I was about to think I did not understand. There's planes on each side of the plane. <laughs> I don't understand <laughs> planes. I mean, do I have to dumb it down for you? <laughs> <laughs> the crew reduced the power on the engines three and four, the ones that are working, in order to attempt to level out the aircraft. Yeah. They, like, they're the best of the best. Yeah. They yeah. yeah. The best. But they lost control due to deceleration and the aircraft stalled. They crashed into a nearby airport hotel. Whoa. It all happened so fast from the moment the pilot commenced takeoff to the moment the plane crashed was only two minutes holy shit and between the tire explosion which is when things went wrong and the crash was only 48 seconds shit and in that time they're trying to troubleshoot trying to remain calm looking for a place to land unfortunately all 109 people on board were killed oh it's awful along with four people on the ground oh my god was it was it a was it sabotage the cut tire well I'll, I'll talk about the investigation okay but the plane's fiery takeoff and crash was captured by a now infamous video and photo, which Jess is looking at right now. Yeah. The video was taken by a passing driver, and the photo was taken by Toshi Hiko Sato, a passenger in an aircraft on a nearby run uh, oh, taxiway. So he's shit. in a plane when he takes took this photo. Okay, I, I mean, obviously. It's much worse to be on that plane. But imagine sitting on another plane and seeing this happen and then and then your plane goes to take off and you're like, actually, um, I think I want to stay oh, here, stay. please. Well, they'd actually just landed. The okay. P- but they were a bit worried because Jacques Chirac, who was the president of France, was also on board the plane watching. <gasps> so they were a bit like, don't crash into the president's plane. The, you know, oh, wow. Heightened security, all that sort of stuff. Great name, Jacques Chirac. Jacques oh. Chirac. So good. Jacques Chirac. That's good. You're that right. So good. That is a good name. Oh, wow. That's full on. So the photo is both incredible and terrifying and I'll post it later this week. Yeah. Because basically there is like tens of metres of flames trailing the plane as it goes. It's just taken off. Yeah. Lots of black smoke. It it's not looking good. Really scary yeah, shit. Yeah, it is. It looks like a like a a rocket taking off, you know, like a spaceship. Yes, absolutely. And then, but then you go, oh yeah, cool, because the 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 Concorde looks like a spaceship. So yeah, like, for I sure. guess that makes sense, but uh, no, that's not good. No, something had gone incredibly wrong. So the tragedy was massive news around the world with its dramatic, fiery image, and of course, everyone wanted to know what the hell had happened. Yeah. Concorde's previously perfect safety record had been smashed forever. I mean, can anything be safe forever? Mm. No. But many wondered if the planes would fly again. Yeah. Oh, shit. Because yeah. it was so dramatic. Like, the plane is on fire as it takes off. What the hell yeah, has happened? it's not good. They were all immediately grounded pending investigation by France's Accident Investigation Bureau. It was discovered that the plane's takeoff weight was calculated to be 186 tonnes including 95 tonnes of fuel, which was one tonne over the maximum takeoff weight. Wow. Which some people said is negligible. But to make the journey, the fuel tanks were chock-a-block. Fuel transfer during taxiing left number five 
Wing tank, 94% full. And this is the tank that burst and caught fire. Okay. So, it's unfortunate that the tank that was punctured at that time was the one that was absolutely full of fuel. Because remember how uh, fuel was transferred throughout yeah, the, right. the plane? Yeah, yeah. Really unlucky. And then once that catches fire, you're fucked. Yeah. Uh, the question on investigators' lips was what caused the tyre to explode yeah. on the runway? They painstakingly combed through the wreckage and made a note of every object and found one thing that couldn't be accounted for. A twisted piece of metal strip, 43 centimetres or 17 inches in length. They just didn't know where it came from. Investigators were able to work out that the piece of metal didn't belong to Concorde and had in fact been left on the runway and that driving over the metal had caused the tyre to rupture, sending a large piece of rubber into the fuel tank, which didn't puncture. In fact, investigators were confused because they found the... the the fuel tank looked like it had been blown from the inside. <gasps> How was coming from the inside? Inside of the tank. How be like thick or f- is this piece of wire that they've rolled over it and? You it's know what I mean? Like that's that seems like. Yeah. You say wire or metal? metal so it's a metal, piece of metal. Sorry, metal. So it's like. What is it? A bit over 30 centimetres long. 43 centimetres long. A foot and a half. That's pretty big, yeah. It, and I've seen the piece of metal. It, it looks a bit like the thickness of like a ruler or something yeah. like that. Right. That is big. So it just got it in the right spot. Right yeah. spot. Wrong spot. But they were confused because the tyre looks like it exploded, hit the fuel tank, but then the fuel tank ruptured from the inside. But usually if an object hits something, it'll smash it yeah. from the outside in. They were really confused. Yeah. And also, jet fuel can't <laughs> burn. Can't <laughs> melt. Melt steel beams. Steel beams. <laughs> Makes you think. (laughs) But after a hunch and many computer simulations, investigators found that what had happened had in fact never happened in a plane before. What? So this is the first time this occurred. The rubber of the tyre hitting the fuel tank had caused a shock wave through the fuel within the tank that sort of bubbled around. And the stress of this movement caused the tank to burst in another spot from the inside. Wow. So it's like it gets hit in one corner. The fuel sloshes around so much that the pressure makes it break in another spot. It just feels like a lot of bad luck. Yeah. yeah. The investigators ran multiple tests and discovered that this is only possible when the, the tank is 94% oh, fuel. Get fucked. Full. Are you serious? 94, 94 which is what it was. Yeah. Not 95 or 93. Yeah, it's Freaking out. That ratio. Because <laughs> it's chock a block. And es- there's essentially, Matt and I are saying the same thing there. <laughs> you know, same intention. Four. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but chose different words. That's that's insane. And remember, like I said, the Concorde moves fuel around the plane throughout the flight. So, it's seriously unfortunate that the tank was that full at that exact second. Exact second, yeah. Because it, ch- it, it automatically moves it around. So, just at that precise just, yeah, moment. F- for takeoff, it's got to be in that It's a freak accident, spot. essentially. Well, Charles de Gaulle's runways are regularly cleaned and monitored for debris, so it was discovered that the bit of metal that they'd driven over had only been dropped by another plane just five minutes before the Concorde took off oh down the runway. Oh, my God. Everything. It's so wild. How unfortunate it is. Yeah. After many months of searching, investigators were able... I can't believe these. People that investigate plane crashes, one, it's horrific stuff, but which I, I imagine that's very hard to deal with, but also they painstakingly go through exploded little bits of nuts yeah. and bolts and they somehow find out this stuff it's amazing after months of searching investigators were able to track down that that piece of metal and identify that it came from continental airlines flight 55 <gasps> which is a mcdonnell douglas dc 1030 it's what's called a wear strip from the door of engine number three whoa it was discovered that the wear strip had been replaced at tel aviv in israel during a sea check on the 11th of June, 2000, and then again at Houston, Texas on 9th of July, 2000, just 11 days before the crash. Oh, so it's pretty new. It was a new bit. The strip installed in Houston had been neither manufactured nor installed in accordance with the procedures as defined by the manufacturer. So what happened? I think the engineer discovered that the bolts what? didn't line up on it, on the piece of metal. Oh, so... So he drilled they, new screws into it. They were able to figure out exactly who the yeah. guy was. So, Concorde had taken off down the runway. It happened to drive over this wear strip, which blew the front tyre, which exploded, sending a large piece of rubber into the fuel tank <gasps> that was so full, it created a shockwave that blew a hole in the fuel tank and it caused a fire that took out two of the engines. Jeez, that engineer in Tel Aviv. You know, you think about every little thing yeah. a plane engineer does. You just don't know what 
you know, the butterfly effect. Thousands of just things. one small thing where you're like, it doesn't quite line up. I'll just, you know, it's on there. It's secure. We're good to go. It's slightly to one side, the screw, but it's all good. That's incredible. So it literally was the perfect storm and the investigation found that there was nothing the crew could have done to avert complete disaster. Oh Once they're in the air, they couldn't get the plane back down. Shit. All 12 remaining Concords were immediately grounded and retrofitted with stronger fuel tanks that were reinforced by Kevlar mm. to try and stop this from ever happening again. Put that in your uh, dragon jeans uh, to go on your motorbike. Kevlar. <laughs> Kevlar. Nice. Wear Kevlar pants. Yeah. It's patted on the ass. Yeah. This is what my dad always told me is like the way they like um, started to advertise those pants was like dragging a guy along the ground behind a motorbike on his ass and at the end he gets up and walks away because he's fine. Yeah. He walks away to the hospital. Yeah, he walked to the hospital, but he was okay. His ass is smooth as a baby's bottom Maybe still. Maybe Kevlar in there. But I guess the, the real question is why don't they just make the whole plane out of Kevlar? Mm. <laughs> Good point. Why don't we make all clothes out of Kevlar? Beautiful stuff. The black box is probably made out of Kevlar. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> Do you know this? Black boxes aren't even black. What do you mean? What colour are they? Orange. Huh? I think. Wild. That doesn't make any sense. It's true. They are orange. But why would they call it a black box then? Exactly. Why aren't they telling us? I think this one goes all the way to the top. <laughs> Alan Joyce? Yeah, it goes straight to Alan Joyce. Let's add that to our email. P.S. <laughs> what the fuck? Alan? But we, he has to just figure out what we mean by that. Yeah. <laughs> He'll be like, is this a lines, black box thing? Yeah. I get it every day. So one of the, th- the things that came from it was they re- reinforced the, the tanks as well as more l- secure electrical controls and specially developed burst-resistant tyres oh, to try and right. cut out all the different little steps of things that had gone wrong. Wow. The Concorde did again fly, but it was really the beginning of the end. John Taylor was the unfortunate mechanic who replaced the wear strip that fell off the DC-10. He was given a suspended sentence for manslaughter in 2010, so many years later, but convictions were overturned by a French appeals court in November 2012, thereby clearing the airline Continental and Taylor of criminal responsibility. Holy shit. But about 100 million euros was paid to the families of the victims of the crash. I mean... 100 million. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it was, a, it was over 100. Yeah, that's right. So, sadly, all good things must come to an end. And whilst the crash wasn't the only reason Concorde ceased flying, it was certainly a nail in the coffin and accelerated its demise. The September 11 attacks just over a year later. <laughs> <laughs> on New York. I actually had written, written here the year after. I've got to be more specific otherwise. <laughs> uh, that rocked the travel industry. Mm as well as everything else on planet Earth, resulting in a massive travel slump that affected Concorde's already pretty dismal profitability. Yeah. Profitability. Especially if they're losing losing sale. Like, they lose money every time somebody doesn't book a seat. Yeah. And I think, like, you know, air travel went down like 40% or something over the months. Honestly, everything changed that day. (laughs) I agree. You know, it's... Day the world changed. Yeah. That's what people say. Pre-9-11 world, Concorde, sure, viable. Yeah. Post-9-11. Nah. It's over. Fuck off, Concord. <clears throat> By 2003, it was revealed it would cost British Airways alone £40 million over the next several years just to maintain the now ageing fleet. These planes had been flying for decades at this point and to keep going would need major upgrades. So they still had the original planes from the 70s going. Yeah, wow. And they still, they look modern still somehow. Yeah, and they, they were still letting people smoke inside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they all had, yeah, velvet. <laughs> it was velvet top to bottom. <laughs> It was shag pile carpet (laughs) all the way around. (laughs) Instead, British Airways decided to pull the pin for good. Air France agreed and operated its last commercial Concorde flight from New York to Paris on May 31st, 2003. British Airways soon followed with their last commercial Concorde flight on October 24th, 2003. In 27 years of service, British Airways' fleet of Concorde made 50,000 flights and carried more than 2.5 million passengers. Wow. These days, they are museum pieces that you can see at various airports and museums around the world, like the one I saw in, in Paris. It was the first time in history of air travel that the industry took a technological step back. Yeah, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? And in the near two decades since, the idea of more SST passenger aircraft have been floated, but not materialised. But let's just make the fucking Airbus faster. Well, I did look it up. Or Jess- move Australia closer. Oh, that's How about that? Just what if? Yeah, what give if us we- a toe. 
Give us a toe. Give us a toe. Maybe bring the south up a little more so we get some nice weather. Yeah. Um, and and then we'll be a bit closer. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Or just shrink the whole world. Oh, shit. That's good. That brings everyone closer. Yeah. Because all I'm thinking down. about is Australia, but there's heaps of countries all over the place. Yeah. Then, like, if you could make it, we could walk to Sydney. That'd be handy. That would be nice. Yeah. Just like one step. Wow. No, you've gone a bit too far there, okay. I reckon. But then, no, then we shrink all of us down by the Ooh. same amount. <laughs> so then, where there's still enough space so for everyone. Yeah. Scalability. But then, how is it one step to Sydney? Because if we're all so smaller, it's going to be a lot of space. Oh, so we'll have to shrink. Shrink the world down again. Hmm. I don't. I don't think you've thought this. Sorry. I reckon he has. I, don't think, I think he's thought about it too much. I don't think this is a good idea. I'm actually backtracking on this one. I'm just uh, looking at the A3. Well, then we'd obviously <laughs> we'd be too big, so we'd just shrink ourselves yeah. down as well. Oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. What about you? Just make yourself big enough for the journey. Step over. Then yeah, oh. then you shrink. Yeah. So at the airports, just become like big shrink rays. And yeah, de shrink rays. Well, th- in that case, why not just make airports like teleportation places? Because uh, the technology is yeah. not available. Come on, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> that's why. That's what are you thinking? Sorry, they haven't come up with that Sorry, yet. How I'm would you do I'm that? I'm so stupid. We're dealing with reality here. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the Airbus A380, which is the big one we talked about before, they tra- their cruising speed is 1185 kilometers an hour, yeah, which wow. is just below Mark One, which is still a lot quicker than like a 747, but. Yep. It's still only about half the speed of the right. Concorde. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's faster. Airbus is such a dull name. Boing, that's fun. <laughs> Boing. <laughs> Boing. I'm going to go flying on a Boing. <laughs> I'm going to go fly on an Airbus. I'm going to go on an Airbus. It's a I'm, bus for the sky. Oh, have fun because I'm going to go Boing. Like whatever, buses suck. Yeah. Buses are the worst Ugh. public transport. Put it in the sky, put it in the sea, I don't care. I don't give a it's shit. It's a bus. What about... It's a sea bus. What about <laughs> Schneckma? Schneckma is good. Schneckma. We like Schneckma. we like Schneckma. Um, wow. Okay, but well that's my report on on the Concorde. I'm kind of sad that I never got to fly on one because they look really really cool. But mm. but maybe you will. Maybe you get your chance to spend ten grand <laughs> <laughs> to spend my life savings on a two hour flight on a plane that's not good for the environment. And they still don't have TVs. <laughs> yeah. They're authentic. <laughs> Fantastic report, Dave. I uh, really enjoyed that. Um, Thank you very much. I've been sitting on this one for a few weeks, so very glad to to get it out there, my little uh, nerding out on the Concorde. Yeah, really cool. They're cool. They look really cool. We'll po- I'll post a bunch of photos on, on social media this week, but uh, yeah, do yourself a favour. Google the Concorde and go, wow, wow that is a cool, those cool chip, looking plane. Chip wings. Uh, well, that brings us to everyone's favourite section of the show where we thank a few of our great supporters. If you want to support this show, uh, helps keeping it run. Um, without these supporters, this show doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. And you can do that at patreon.com slash dogoonpod or dogoonpod.com. And you once you're there, you can sign up on all sorts of levels. Different levels have different rewards. Uh, you've got bonus episodes. We do three per month on certain levels. We've got a Facebook group that everyone... All supporters uh, can get involved in, uh, which a lot of people call the nicest corner of the internet. Yeah. Uh, that you can also vote for topics, like Dave's topic today, uh, and a bunch of a bunch of other things as well, uh, including shout-outs, which we're going to do a little bit of now. One of the levels on the Sydney Scheinberg level, you get to give us a fact, a quote, or a question, and then I read them out uh, for the first time as I'm doing the episode yeah i don't read him till i read him he would never you know what i mean yes so (laughs) don't i just i'm just saying i'm giving myself an out for when i mispronounce a lot of things Mm. um so the first one this week comes from aiden coglin but before i say that i should say (laughs) this section i think actually has a little jingle it goes something like this fact quote or question Uh, he always remembers the ding. So this first one comes from Aiden Coglin. Uh, fact quote or questioners also get to give us a title or give themselves a title. And Aiden's got the title of Director of Tuba Procurement at the Harold Bishop Foundation for the Arts. Oh. Harold Bishop being an iconic... Tubist. Tubist and uh, Neighbours character played by Ian... Fleming? Ian Fleming. Huey Hewitson. Ian... I don't know his name, sorry. I think it's Ian. It's not Ian. Is it not Ian? Is it Jess's uh, family friend, Ian? Yeah, is it Ian? (laughs) It's Jess's family friend, Ian. He only flies first class. 
Harold. <laughs> That's uh, such a funny thing to say to a kid. I know. I mean, if you must fly, you, <laughs> you've got to fly first. It's the only way to what? travel. What I don't think it is, about? Ian. <laughs> Look, here comes over here. Ian Smith. Why? How could I <laughs> forget such fake. an exciting name? <laughs> that sounds fake. Uh, so, Aiden uh, is asked us a question. Okay. So, yeah, obviously there are... There's no, um, no, we had no thinking time for this. But the question is, are there more wheels or doors in the world? Oh, I've this seen this question. going around the internet yeah. a little bit. Uh, Aiden writes, I can't answer my own question as is your usual preference because it seems that nobody can. But as you've probably heard, it's divided people online lately. So I'd love to know if each of you <laughs> are on team wheel or team door and why. Some things to consider. Office buildings and ships have lots of doors but no wheels. Offices, however, are usually full of chairs that each have three to four wheels. Fuck, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, fridges, <laughs> cupboards, wardrobes and the like do have doors but no wheels unless they're sliding doors. Drawers usually have wheels. Uh, cars... Do they? Sometimes they do. I don't yeah, think they Yeah, like that sort do. of mechanism. Like I'm looking at like a sliding door on a, on a cupboard there and it's also, got little wheels on it. Yeah, like uh, the... A dishwasher will often yep, have wheels, on, wheels. The, on the racks and stuff. I, I reckon it's wheels. Uh, cars tend to have four doors, five if you include the boot and six if you include the bonnet, to four wheels, but then trucks, bikes and scooters flip that ratio on its head. I don't know if we, we'd call the bonnet a door. Yeah, where, what, where do you draw the line? Mr. I'd say that's closer to a lid. Or a hatch. Mr. Bean's enemy's car has two doors but three wheels. That's true. Microwaves tend to have three wheels for every one door. Mm. Submarines might have wheels because nothing about them makes sense anyway, so why not? Correct, Aiden. Thank you. Uh, Neither Jim Morrison nor Ray Manzarek (laughs) had wheels. They're from the band The Doors. Mm -hmm. Ralph, uh, Ralph Jesus did not have wheels. What's that mean? Is that a Simpsons reference? Ralph. Je- Ralph, comma, Jesus did not have wheels. Oh, sorry. I thought you were saying there's a guy called Ralph, Ralph Jesus. Jesus. Sorry. <laughs> I, and I was like, is he from a band called The the Wheels or something? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Finally, uh, let's say for the sake of argument that hinges are not wheels because that would be a cop out. P.S. I'm sorry if this is horribly dated by the time we get around to reading it out. I'll make up for it by posting a Harlem Shake video and pouring some <laughs> ice water over my head. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I reckon wheels. Yeah, I reckon wheels. I'm, I'm team door. Doors? I think instinctively I thought doors, but having seen a lot of TikToks and videos yeah. with They're showing places, like conveyor belts yeah. that are just entirely made of wheels. And, and room, like, rooms, like there was this one where it was just a room with wheels all over the floor. Mm. You used to sort of slide things across, some sort of industrial building. And I'm right. Like, all right. That so convinced like, me. One... Two, I'm counting how many doors are in my oh, apartment. Oh, no. We're going to start the count. Oh, two, no. three, four, five, six, seven, eight doors <laughs> Those in knobs apartment. on your oven, are they are they wheels? What? Does it, is a knob oh, a wheel? No, what? a knob's what? not a wheel. A knob's not a wheel. But then there's cupboard <laughs> doors. You're right. There's not that many cupboards. There's a real lack of storage space in this place. Yeah. Well, that's on this place. Come on. Lots. I reckon I'm just going to say wheels. And I say that not really giving a shit. <laughs> Well, I mean, no, you know I don't think mean? anyone no, but really some people, gives But some shit. people get so into it. I think that's a bit. No one's actually caring. I think people care, Matt. And that's sad. That's like the scone thing. No one actually cares. Matt, it's just sort you of fun care. To, it's fun to pretend <laughs> that you care a bit. Okay, I'll pretend to care. I think it's wheels. I'm actually coming around to wheels because I just had the thought that... Yes, I've succeeded in bringing with, him around to uh, wheels. With doors, you get a door. <laughs> You're gonna. You got a door. You got a gym. You got a gym. You got a gym. Does that play into the How setup? many gyms yeah. are there? But in the sometimes world? <laughs> people like those big muscle men move around big wheels. So maybe they've got a gym with a wheel. But what about with a, a like you know at my house? There's doors that are 100 years old. They've just been there for a whole time. But there's no tires <gasps> that you use for 100 years. Yeah. <gasps> aren't they? I've got hiccups real bad. Uh, <laughs> don't they? Notor- you know, wheels are kind of or tires are notoriously hard to get rid of, and don't, aren't some of them just buried out? In landfill yeah, you forever? Re- you that replace wheels and do- and tires more than you replace Way doors. Way more than a door. And, and the wheel was like one of the early inventions. Yeah. That got met, they've got, got mi- yeah, what, humans they didn't going. put doors on the cave. Yeah, yeah they've no. got tens of thousands of years on the door. Or did you count like the boulder rolling in front of a cave? A wheel. A wheel. <laughs> or a door. A door. I mean, it's like a door wheel. So what do you, what do you reckon? 
I think it's wheels. I reckon it's wheels. I've come around to wheels. Yes. I'm sad to say. But a tyre's wheels. Well, tyres go on wheels, don't they? Yeah. You change tyres a lot, but you don't change, change wheels. Change the wheels. So if you count tyres as well, I mean, it's But just... if you're thinking tyres like you're thinking cars, there's a lot of cars out there. And you change those more frequently than you change the doors of your house, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know? And there's also... I've had the hot wheels. more cars. I've changed my cars more times than I've changed the doors in my house. I'll say that. Say that for sure. But you, but when you change the car, that gets crushed down and reuses other metals. I don't think those wheels exist anymore. Right. But more, but new wheels have been made. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, I guess, the same amount of wheels that makes then, you think, isn't it? doesn't it? Oh, bloody hell. Uh, thank you very much, Aiden. Looking forward to that Harlem Shake video. <laughs> uh, next one comes from Vincenzo Bonadonna. Vinny! A.K.A. Mr. Apologetic. Uh, oh. And v- Why? <laughs> Vincenzo has also asked a question, which is, uh, before I ask my question, I would like to give you guys a brag and an apology. I apologize for asking y'all to change my Fat Quota question submission. Listening back to the show, it seemed as if... It wasn't as simple as I thought and probably caused a bit of an inconvenience. Won't happen again. Vincenzo, let me tell you, it wasn't an inconvenience enough for me to remember I it. I don't remember it at all. So I don't I don't think it was any big deal at Not all. Not at all. Because um, I, I carry beefs with me yeah. oh, to my yeah. grave. I don't let things so go if I, easily. If I had any beef with it, yeah. I would remember. If I'm wronged, I'll know it. I remember it. <laughs> And I, I forgive, but I will not forget. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Never again, my friend. Uh, Vincenzo continues. My brag is actually for y'all. Uh, God, I, that sounds stupid when you say <laughs> it. I really, appre- <laughs> I really appreciate that you guys could come up with quality content and comedy every week. I don't really know how much work goes behind it. So my question is, how long does it take each of you to prepare a report for Do Go On? Uh, Vincenzo has answered uh, the question. Oh, well. fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> That's so good. Great. What's the answer? <laughs> Saying, back when I was in school and I had to do reports, I was always a procrastinator <laughs> and didn't get my work done until the day before it was due and then used my ability to improv, in brackets BS, <laughs> through the oral part of the report. Yeah, you've definitely tapped into something there, at least for two-thirds of the podcast. Dave and Jess. <laughs> um, I think it varies greatly between the three of us and then also varies uh, individually. Like sometimes it could take me ages. Some I've had dream runs and I've really smashed it out in like a day um, or in a few hours or something after, you know. I might watch documentaries or I read a bunch and then the actual writing doesn't take very long. But generally, a uh, couple of days. Yeah. I'd say between me. a couple of days, a couple of weeks, depending on... The topic and... How much time you have in a day. Like, you know, if you're working on it just at nights, you know, fitting it in a couple of hours here or there around other stuff, it obviously takes longer. And I try to have a dedicated sort of writing day once a week. And then, yeah, sometimes it's just like it's all I'm, it's all I'm thinking about yeah. for ages because, it, I don't know, some, yeah, some of them, and I can think of certain ones where I'm, I'm listening to an audio book about it as I go to sleep yeah. and I'm reading and writing about it during the days and though you know those ones end up being pretty long episodes, but um, and then other yeah, it just depends. Some stories just don't have that much information as well. So yeah, you kind of makes it easier and harder. And then other ones, ones that have unlimited information, I'll just keep writing until it's time to start doing the show. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just I guess it depends on how early I start. Some stories are like harder to figure out the structure. Like sometimes you're like, where do I start here? Do I leave this important piece of information as a reveal for later? Some of them are really linear and it's it's easy. Yeah. Sometimes it's hey, yeah, that's right, that's me. You might be wondering how I got here. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it all started. <laughs> yeah. So it varies a bit, Dave. What do you reckon? Yeah, totally, totally varies. I reckon, like for example, this report took me. A good two or three days, just be, pardon me, because I sort of, talking about structure, I sort of treated it as two separate reports. Like I did one, I knew I was going to finish with that big crash. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, it's, sorry, these hiccups are so bad. I mean, we could have just paused the recording and let you get over these hiccups. But, but I, we've can made, get, I can get them really We've bad. made you, the same, but we've made you just persevere. Uh, and so I, I would have done, I did all the report on the history of Concord up until the crash. And then afterwards, and then I went back and I just researched the crash part. Yeah, okay, yeah. I went quite specific on that. So, yeah, probably two or three days. Yeah. This one. But, yeah, sometimes you're right. It's a biography. There's limited info and it's very linear, so you can just put it all together. 
bang, 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 but... Yeah. So yeah, some topics... Uh, sometimes, I felt with me speci- specifically, the longer the episode, the more time I've probably spent right writing it and then i guess like it's not just the research side of it as well obviously we record and so far we've been recording for two hours on this episode and then we'll go away and essentially whoever's editing it listens through that entire time as well yeah i'm going to edit this down to about 15 minutes yeah (laughs) (laughs) you kind of cut out any pauses or when we need to restart a sentence or whatever or my dog barking or um so that's that's a couple of hours as well at the other end yeah, yeah usually I think, that can take a while. I think it, I normally the edit takes about three times as long as the episode for me. I reckon. So if it's a three-hour episode, it'll be like a nine-hour edit. You do slow it down though to listen to it. You yeah, put it down on like I half do. speed, yeah, quarter yeah. speed. I put it on a third speed, <laughs> and I don't edit at all. Just listen to it slowly. And go, yep, perfect. <laughs> put it out. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, I hope that but I think my, my editing takes longer because I fumble a lot in my reports. Whereas Dave and Jess are smooth as a baby's bottom. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Vincenzo. Uh, next one comes from Sophie Waldron, whose title is Retired Ass Man. <laughs> <laughs> Retired Ass Man's funny. And uh, <laughs> Soph has offered us a brag, writing, I just resigned from my job as assistant manager of a... J- oh, Ass Man, assistant mm-hmm. manager. Very good stuff. Very good. Uh Of a jewellery store, I've never had the privilege of being an arse prod, but I've enjoyed my time as an arse man. The rest of my team has also quit in the past few weeks, so while this is a brag about getting a new, better paying and more impressive job, I also would love if you guys could help me say goodbye to the team because none of us are good with genuine emotion and instead use sarcasm to avoid things getting too real. To the 686 gals, I wanted to say... Working alongside each of you for the last few years has been one of the best times of my life and I'm so grateful to know each and every one of you. We may be saying goodbye to the store, but we will always be in each other's lives. That's nice. That's nice. I'm going to miss seeing your gorgeous faces every day and it will be so odd not working with people who get all my stupid jokes and references. I love you all. Thanks for that team. See you at the live shows. Hey, we did see you at the last live show. So yeah. Front row, Santa. What uh, a legend. I think Soph might have been the person who corrected me on how I said in the in the April Fool's episode, mm-hmm. I said something like, I can't remember the word, but me congratulatory. Con, con, congratu, congratulatory. No, what is that word? I don't think that was the word, but it was something along those lines. Or congratulatory. Yeah, congratulatory. Congratulatory. Uh, thank you, Soph. That's very nice. Finally, from Matthew Bohr, uh, aka Champion of Whispering Encouraging Words into Excellent Rectangles. Okay. <laughs> uh, Matthew Bohr <laughs> has offered us a fact. Often, I never know if it's a reference to something we've said that I can't remember or if it's a reference to something they're about to say or something else entirely. Anyway, Matthew writes, hey, do go on. Though this will probably be a couple of months behind the episode airing, I thought I could give some fast and maybe furious facts about the Fast and Furious franchise. Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure we covered everything (laughs) in that podcast. As it is one of my favourites to see how it has grown over time. Uh, here, Here they come. Timothy Oliphant was the original pick for Dom Toretto before he turned what? it down, leaving the door open for Vincent Diesel. I can't picture that. Very different movie. Very different movie. I think First I'd probably prefer hair. it. Handsome. Handsome. I mean, Vincent's pretty handsome, No, probably. he's no, no Timothy he's no Oliphant. Timothy. Come on. Come on. Uh, wow. Did you do Gone in 60 Seconds instead? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, next one in Fast Five, the vault being pulled through the street is a combination of CGI and a chopped up truck inside an empty vault, uh, driving through the streets while cabled up. A chopped up truck inside an empty vault. Yeah, a bit of fun. That's confusing. Uh, Fast Five also introduces Eleanor, the lady cop, who yes. is played by Chris Hemsworth's wife uh, Elsa Pataki. Oh, I didn't know. And is now some of her. Is now one of her most recognised roles. Fast Six is the start of the shift to a bigger ma- mix of car stunts and hand-to-hand action. Six introduced MMA fighter Gina Carino and Joe Taslam, uh, while sequels have added Tony Jaa, Ronda Rousey and Jason Statham. Sequels. 
adding the <laughs> WWE with The Rock and John Cena has also boosted this. Hmm. Lastly, I would like to throw a name in the ring for Jason Statham theme pod. Okay. Uh, the movies that make Jason stay fun. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Thanks, guys. Hope to see you on a North American tour soon. Hey, the thank movie... you so much, <laughs> Matthew Bohr. The movies that make Jason stay fun. <laughs> Matthew, I got to be honest with you. Truthfully, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It sucks. I, was, see, I just did a little. I just did a imagine, little. I'm having seeing it written down. What? <laughs> <laughs> My favourite still, I now pronounce you man and knife. Oh, that's what we should call the podcast, man, man and, and knife. knife. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm knife. <laughs> I'm uh, and. <laughs> as if Dave is man. Come on. He's the end. <laughs> All right, take it. Give me the title. Is man. it an and or an ampersand? What do you reckon? Man. Ampersand knife. Right, I'm the ampersand. <laughs> the human ampersand. <laughs> Oh, those are great. All right. Uh, the next thing we like to do is uh, shout out a few of our other great supporters. Um, Jess, you normally come up with a little game based on the topic? Yes. We are going to say something interesting about them. Oh, like a fact? <laughs> I don't know for this one actually. Um, I was hoping, I was padding. I was hoping that maybe I um, I could think of something. I thought of something as we as we went. Maybe it was some sort of barrier that they've broken. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, if I can kick us off first up, I'm not I'd, sure I can do this, but okay. I'd love to thank from the woodlands in Texas, in the, in the United States, Amy Keller, who of course broke the uh. The uh, leg press barrier. Whoa! Um, which people people thought you'd disintegrate once if you yeah. leg press beyond a ton. Yep. But Amy Keller did it. What'd she do? She she just her just leg muscles got a little bit bigger again. But she do more than a ton or just a ton? Broke the ton. Whoa! A ton plus one. Ton plus one. Yeah. One more ton. One more ton. So two tons. Two tons. That would have been tons. an easier way to say it. Yeah. Wow. She smashed the barrier. Holy shit. Yeah. I mean, you could just add like those little plates that are like 1.25. You could just add those and you would have beaten it. You didn't have to do two tons. Yeah. It's not, is that, it wouldn't be the leg press barrier. That would be the the ton barrier. She, bro- she broke, broke the, the ton, ton barrier. barrier. By yeah. leg pressing it. Yeah. Wow. I'd also love to thank from Sydney in God's country, Ohio in the United States, Laura Denny. Laura Denny. What about the coffee barrier? Oh, Broke my the coffee. lord. Broke the caffeine barrier. They said you shouldn't have more than 30 coffees in a day. Well, or you'd disintegrate. They say way less than that, actually. <laughs> well, Laura did 31 Whoa, coffees. Is Laura okay? In a day. Is Laura okay? Yeah. What do you mean? She's very awake. Very productive? Mm-mm. Got a lot Absolutely done today? buzzing. Holy, I'd be a nightmare and I'd be shitting my guts out. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, records take sacrifice. That's true. And finally, I'd love to thank from Charleston in South Carolina in the United States, David Kapler. David Kapler. That's a great name. David Kapler. Kapler's really fun. Mm. David Kapler broke... The, I don't. I don't think I get this one. Broke the uh, sight barrier. Whoa! People are like, oh, we'll never. This was happened a long, long time ago. But people used to be like, you can't, you can't travel faster than the speed of sight, uh-huh. which is even faster than the speed of sound. Dave, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Maybe this happened in the future then, and um, depending on whether it's happened yet or not, <laughs> and. Uh, but David did it. If wow. it's even a thing that's possible. Oh, wow. I'm sure it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, David beat the speed of sight. And uh, so, so, so it's moving faster than like before. So what can, can he s- see? Anything is just black. Yeah. You know, like. Just empty. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It's like uh, like hyperdrive. Yeah. In a s- space movie. <laughs> yeah, Yeah, sick. it's just like stars flashing Just by. hitting the NOS on your spaceship. Yeah. It's like <laughs> NOS. Only even faster. Wow. wow. The NOS barrier. That's yeah. crazy. David Kapler. Dev, do you want to thank some people? David sure. Kapler. First time he did it, he crapled his pants. 
<laughs> you didn't get that all through school. <laughs> Sorry, David. I'd like to thank from London in Great Britain. London. Lu- Louise Thorne. Louise Thorne. What about the Goosebumps Barrier? Whoa. Oh. Read every single Goosebumps back <laughs> to back. They said it was too scary. Too spooky. But Louise did it. Louise, you'll, Broke- s- you'll be so spooked. She hasn't slept in weeks. Whoa. <laughs> from the Goosebumps. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of them. There's so many of there's them. So many. Read them all. In like record time as well? Well, just... Speed of reading, so quite... She broke the speed of reading? Wow. Wow. Reading Goosebumps? Yeah. Wow. Are you guys fast readers? No. No. I'm quite quick, apparently. Really? I think I'm pretty average. Okay. I think I'm slow. I do a lot of repeating. My mind wanders. Yeah. And I go, oh, I've just... (laughs) I've read a chapter and I haven't taken any of it Yeah, I have no idea what happened. Back to the start. (laughs) Yeah, I hate that. You know when you're driving and your mind drifts off? Yeah. That's scary. Yeah, yeah. When it's a book, you're like... (laughs) <laughs> you can't rewind 30 seconds before the crash <laughs> I would like to thank from Hamburg in Germany now Ut Martens or Ut Ut Martens Oh, I like that name so much It's, it's a very nice name Hamburg, isn't it? I had a great time in Hamburg Where'd you, What Irish pub do you go to? <laughs> Father Flanagan No, I remember that was sort of <laughs> The, 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 the Guinness The Reaper Barn was like the, like the nightclub district and Yeah um, Did you go and get a nice Italian meal or something while you were there? Remember staying in a twelve-bed dorm? Uh, <laughs> no, was that was like an eighteen-bed dorm. No theme. It was just a <laughs> massive dorm. But that's where I was staying when I went and I saw scorpions. Wow, eighteen Hell in a yeah. dorm's too many. By it was the way. so that big. Sucks. It was a big L shape. What about Oot broke the scorpions barrier by getting them to play Winds of Change <laughs> one, more, one last time. <laughs> Saying, ooh, oh yeah, baby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's so good. Was it a massive venue? It was a festival, yeah. So yeah. it was it was big, out, huge outdoor, biggest festival I've ever been to, I think. That was at Varken. Oh, cool. And who else? You had some, there was some massive bands there, weren't there? Yeah, massive metal bands. Yeah. Would have been sick. It was real good. I, yeah, Motorhead were the headliners. <sighs> Love it. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Oot. And I'd like to thank now from a location that is unknown Ooh, to us. Moles. I can only assume it's deep within the fortress. It is David Plant. Broke the barrier to the center of the earth. Whoa. What? They said yeah. it couldn't be done. I know. It got to the earth's core. Dug his way down and then went, ha, huh, that's crazy. Wow. And then straight back up. Dug, dug his way up. Yeah, dug his way up. Dug up. Dug, dug, ba- dug back up. Dig up, stupid. <laughs> Great work, David Plant. <laughs> What's that Plant. from? Is that from something? Simpsons. That's Simpsons. Simpsons. Of yeah, course it of course, is. Yeah. If you ever question where a random quote in your head is from, it's The Simpsons. Yeah. May I thank some people? Yes, please. I would love to thank from Brunswick here in Victoria, Lindley Evis. Oh, broke the piss barrier. <laughs> Break the seal. Broke the piss barrier. Yeah. On, a, on a night out? On a night out, Few too yeah. many vodka cranberries and then... In record time. And, I was reading about there, there used to be some nightclub... Can't remember where it was. You see this? Yeah. And they had a they had a night that was um, drinks were free until the first person was this on like a Patreon seal. group or something? Maybe. Maybe it was. Yeah. And so apparently it got real brutal. People, if anyone pissed, there'd be fights starting, and people would be pissing in the corners of the pub. Yeah, and just stuff. to not go to the just, toilet. Just a real sort of what a terrible dystopian. promotion. <laughs> yeah, it's not <laughs> so, a good idea. Uh, so yeah. So when Lindley did it <laughs> the first time, yeah, it, that wasn't one of the good records that was broken. Well, uh, still a congratulations to you, Lindley. I would also love to thank from Rifle. Fuck, that's badass. In Colorado, CO. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, I would love to thank Aaron Romero. Aaron Romero. Aaron Romero. What about broke the vending machine barrier? Oh. Cleaned it out. Okay. Everything. Emptied the vending machine. Really? <laughs> all the drinks, all the snacks. Th- that barrier. Even the crappy, <laughs> crappy like apricot bars that no one actually Nobody really wants. wants. It's been yeah. there for six years. Cleaned it out. Wow, got Broke everything. The protein the, cookie yeah, that got, nobody wanted. Broke the barrier. <laughs> it's got three grams of protein. That's not a lot of protein. <laughs> Cleaned it out. <laughs> That's a lot of cookie. It's a, lot, it's a big <laughs> fucking cookie. She's there, for, my head. she was there for six hours with the coins. <laughs> oh, she paid for all of them. Oh, yeah. Okay. I yeah. don't see how th- where the barrier is. 
Oh, well, people said it shouldn't be done. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a faux pas. Yeah. It's a social barrier. You were but thinking she smashed the, yeah. the physical barrier. The glass. Get it, yeah. yeah. No, 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 she, it was, no, she paid for everything, but she was at the airport and it was the only vending machine in the whole place. And there was a line behind her hoping to get a snack pre-flight. She's like, no, nah, fuck all of you. No way. Then she, she sat sold and stand them. next door. Yeah, then she sold them at <laughs> a big markup. markup. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's good, Erin. Genius. Well done. That's well done, very Aaron. good. Especially it was a blizzard. All those people had no other choices. <laughs> there were three days in the airport and she owned every <laughs> morsel of Just food. Just because she had so many coins on her. Holy shit. Um, and finally, I would love to thank from Alston, Massachusetts, Walker Anderson. Oh, that's oh, good. Oh, Will Anderson. Um, Bizarro Will Anderson. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, people would call Wow short for Walker. No, nah, I reckon you just call them Walker. <laughs> don't reckon. I don't think they'd get called Wow. Maybe wall. Walk. Walks. Walk. Uh, broke the speed of smell. Whoa. <laughs> Somebody farted. <laughs> yep. He knew within 0.3 milliseconds. Yes. Isn't that crazy? Like, <laughs> chess. <laughs> <laughs> I did say he could identify. That's a different skill altogether. Just, but <laughs> just again. Well had them both. <laughs> well, the nose Anderson. <laughs> Dave, girls don't do that. <laughs> so that's girls don't fart, gentlemen don't shit. <laughs> so that's silly that you blamed it on me. Thank- that's what made that so funny. <laughs> Thank you so much to Walker, Aaron, Lindley, David, <sighs> you, Lewis, Louise, David, Laura, and Amy. The last thing we like to do is welcome a few great supporters into our Triptych Club. So to be in the club, you've got to be on the shout out level or above. Uh, for three straight years, unless, of course, Dave is organising it, uh, which he did a few episodes back when he just brought people in <laughs> willy-nilly. But <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> hey, no, he did his I, best. I, I, I was uh, hey, look, I was absent, so fair enough. If you want, if you want, in, just meet me, meet me around back. I'll get you in. I'll get you. In. <laughs> I think one of the people who came into the Triptych Club had signed up the day before. But anyway, from every other episode, you've got to have been signed up for three. I made up some years names. On the shadow All right. level or above. Well done to Philip Neighbor. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> uh, so, the way we normally do this is, uh, you know, a bit of theatre of the mind. I'm standing on the door. The club, uh, you get a ticket. It's a lifelong pass. Once you're in, you're in for as long as you like. Dave's the MC, he's the hype man. He's yep. standing on the stage welcoming you, in, welcoming you in. Everyone who's already been in there standing and cheering you on as Dave hypes you up from the stage. He welcomes you in after I've checked you in off the door. Jess is behind the bar, normally comes up with a, a cocktail base. What's the Concord cocktail? We've got beluga caviar. Oh, yes. Blended oh. with gin. Oh. And that is fancy. Shake it up right. Whoa, that is and a fancy got, cocktail. I'm not done. Then it's got a garnish of a cherry. Oh my gosh, that is luxurious. Yeah, that's luxury, baby. And also blended lobster. <laughs> Whoa. Shaken it's with five vodka. courses in one drink. It's honestly disgusting. Uh, and Dave, you've normally booked a band? Yes, amazingly. You're never going to believe this. I have booked the band Concord. <laughs> right. Wow, wow, which is a. How'd you uh, get them? Um, I just reached out. <laughs> I slid into their DMs. Honestly, I'm I'm now starting to see his process. He just went to Spotify and typed in Concord. He Don't. didn't. He didn't think Flight of the Concords <laughs> or Scorpions. No, a couple of bands. No, we talk about. Concord, Concord, most famous for their song "Just Kiss Her." Thirty million plays. Not bad. Really? Not bad at all. All right. Well, we've got. Uh, looks like eight uh, inductees today. I can I just say the Snowman. lead singer of the band, Stephen? It's a one person. Project Stephen Becker, PhD. <laughs> That's so good. Love that they've Dr. Added Stephen that. Becker. All uh, right, great. Dave, are you ready? Because I'm ready to hype you. Oh, so I'm going to hype these people. Hell yeah, let's do it. I mean, that's how we've always done it. I don't know why this is a surprise to you this week. Yes. Oh, I guess I'll have a go. We've never <laughs> done this before. <laughs> All right. So, first up from Suva in Fiji, it's Dave Cullen. Dave Cullen. I'm not feeling sullen. I've got Dave Cullen. Yes. From Hawthorne in. Melbourne, Australia. It's Ebony at Maja. Or at Maya. <laughs> I bow down to the Maya yep. at Maya. Yes. 
Uh, from Kinross in Western Australia, it's Jacob Lane, our Simpsons Jacob expert. Lane! Uh, let me just say, Doll, it's Jacob Lane. Yeah, that's good stuff. Come on, mate. You can't say that's not amazing. I mean, it's, I don't know how that's a hype up. Come on, but keep with the flow from going. From McKellar in Australia's Capital Territory, it's Alex. I don't feel like I'm in McKellar. I'm in McKevin. Yeah, with Alex. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. From Copenhagen in Denmark, it's Fabian Peterson. Oh, I don't remember how it was Copenhagen before you arrived, yeah, but I'm Fabian. feeling better now, Fabian. From Denver, Colorado in the United States, it's Scott. More like hot. From... <laughs> Oakdale in, I want to say, Minnesota in the United States. It's Tim Kaiser. Kaiser. This night was Shizer without Tim yeah, Kaiser. Yeah, Tim Kaiser's here. And finally, from Aylesbury in Great Britain, it's Maisie Doe. What Aylesbury, you? Maisie Doe wasn't here, but she's now here. Maisie Doe is an incredible name. No, Holy shit. Maisie Doe. It sounds like a, a dance move. Yeah. yeah. And Do-si-do. Maisie Doe. Doe. Do. Maisie, thank you so much. Thanks. You are amazing. Welcome in Maisie, Tim, Scott, Fabian, Alex, Jacob, Ebony, and Dave. And that brings us to the end of the episode. Jess, is there anything else we need to do before we put this baby home? Um, uh, Just to remind people that they can suggest a topic at dogoonpod.com or there's a link in the show notes. You can find us on social media at dogoonpod across uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, And, uh, you know, go out there and do something nice for a stranger. Oh, okay. <laughs> what, like take them for a ride in your Concord. your boat from on the water? Just offer a group of jet skiers to go for a little ride? <laughs> yeah, do something nice like that. It'd be uh, fun. That's nice. Yeah, that it is, is nice. nice. All right, well, let's wrap it up, Dave. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode. But until then, I'll say thank you so much and uh, goodbye. Later. Bye. Bye. Ooh, oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah, you got